Hello, my name is Adam. In this video, we are going to learn how to make Pac-Man in Unity. Pac-Man is a maze action game developed and released by Namco in 1980. The player controls Pac-Man, who must eat all the dots or pellets inside an enclosed maze while avoiding four colored ghosts. Eating large flashing dots called power pellets causes the ghosts to turn blue, allowing Pac-Man to eat them for bonus points. This tutorial will be much more advanced compared to my previous tutorials. Pac-Man has a number of difficult problems to solve since there is a fair amount of complexity to the game. I'll do my best to explain everything along the way, but just keep in mind that this will be challenging and I would not necessarily recommend this be the first game you make if you've never made a game in Unity before. Specifically, we are going to learn a lot about sprites, tile maps, and AI behaviors. So let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, let's begin by creating a new project using the Unity Hub. In the top right corner, we can click the blue new button to create a new project. And specifically, we want to click the drop down so we can select the version of Unity we're going to use. For this project, we want to use Unity 2021.1. And the reason for this is because we're going to utilize a Unity package that will already be pre-installed with that specific version of Unity. This package is called 2D Tile Map Extras. It's going to make the development of our Pac-Man game a lot easier. You don't have to use, um, or if you choose not to use Unity 2021, you can still use this package. You just might need to install it manually and you might need to pick the respective version of this package based on the version of Unity you're using. So all in all, it'll just be easier to start with Unity 2021. So let's select that. We're gonna to switch to use the 2D template since this is going to be a 2D game. And let's go ahead and name our game or our project. Choose wherever you'd like to save your project and go ahead and click the create button. This might take a couple minutes to initialize, so we'll pick it back up once it's finished. All right, now that our project is open, let's first just verify that that 2D tile map extras package is installed. So we can go to Window Package Manager. In here, indeed, we can see that our package is installed. This will list all of the packages that are installed for our project. You can also add new ones if you need to. So like I said before, if you're using a different version of Unity, you might need to install this package manually. Um, and the version of that package might need to vary based on the version of Unity you're using. And so you can do that from here. But like I said, it's much easier to just start with our latest version of Unity 2021.1. And this will already be st installed for us and we don't have to worry about it. But here, so Unity provides us a sample scene by default. The first thing I'm going to do is just simply rename this to Pac-Man. And we're good there. And then on the left here is our hierarchy, which displays all of the game objects that exist in our scene. And so by default, there's a camera game object, a camera component, and an audio listener. And so we want to change a couple properties on this. One, we're going to make the background color black. And I'm also going to change the size here. I'm going to change it to about 18. What this is going to do is effectively zoom out. Um, let me illustrate this so you can see. So let me just temporarily put a sprite in here. So you can see the sprite at that size. Depending on the size of my camera, you're effectively zooming in or out. Um, 18 will perfectly fit our um, our entire um, layout and grid um, for Pac-Man. So 18, we can go ahead and delete that. We don't actually want that. And then finally, we want to adjust the positioning of our camera just slightly. So we're gonna move it up negative one, and that's actually it. And the reason for that is because if you look at a grid of Pac-Man, Notice how at the top here, there's three rows, but on the bottom there's two. So overall, the actual um, tile map for the, the bounds of the, of the level is a little bit higher, or there's more space on the top than there is on the bottom. So we're going to shift um, our camera just so it centers it correctly. And that's actually going to be it for our just basic scene setup. We're not gonna actually create any other game objects yet. 
but I do want to change a couple project settings next. So we're gonna go to project settings. If that um, tab isn't there for you, go to window or sorry, go to edit project settings. And specifically, we're gonna go to the physics 2D tab. And there's this collision matrix at the bottom, which allows us to say which layers collide with other layers. And so first we actually need to create a few new layers for the various objects we're going to have in our game. I figured we can just create all the layers we're going to need right away. That way we don't have to worry about them. So to create a new layer, I can just create a new game object. Here you can see the layer drop down, and there's an add layer button. This is typically how you'll add new layers. So we can click that. And let's go ahead and just create the, all the layers we're going to need. So we're going to want a layer called Pac-Man. We're going to want a layer called Ghost. We're going to want a layer for our pellets and for our obstacles or like the walls of our scene. Um, and then finally, let's create one other layer called Node. And obviously, I'll explain what these do as we start developing each of the respective um, objects and whatnot. Some of them are probably already self-explanatory, but um, yeah, we'll definitely go over that in more detail. But then here, notice our collision matrix is much bigger. It's showing all those new layers, and this is going to allow us to turn on or off collisions between these layers. So for our particular game, um, we don't want, for example, um, collision between pac-man and the nodes the nodes are going to be these invisible objects that the ghosts will collide collide with or not really collide with but the ghosts will trigger them and they'll use these to determine their movement and stuff so those are really just for the ghosts we don't want pac-man to actually collide with those we do want pac-man to collide with obstacles with the pellets with other ghosts or with the ghosts um we don't want Pac-Man to collide with himself. That would really only matter if there was multiple Pac-Man in our game, but um, there won't be, but just in case we'll turn that off. We do want ghosts to collide with the nodes. We do want ghosts to collide with obstacles. We don't want ghosts to collide with our pellets, and we don't want ghosts to collide with other ghosts. And then finally, pellets don't need to collide with anything. Obstacles don't need to collide with anything, and the nodes don't need to collide with anything. Um, really, though, the most important one is turning off the collision between Pac-Man and the nodes and um, the ghost and the pellet and the ghost and the ghost. And that will be it for our layers and our collision matrix. Let's import all the sprites we're going to use for Pac-Man. You are absolutely more than welcome to use your own sprites if you'd like, but otherwise you can use the same sprites I'll be using. All of them are available to download through GitHub. There's a link in the description of the video. Um, that project actually will have everything, the full source code, the full project, all the sprites, everything you need will be available through GitHub. Once again, there's a link in the description of the video. Specifically, if you're looking for the sprites, you can go to the assets folder, go to the sprites folder, and you can find them all in there. Let me go ahead and drag all of these sprites into our project. Um, actually, first, let me create a new folder. So let's create a folder called Sprites. And let's go ahead and drag all of these in. And we will need to change some of our import settings on all of these. So let's go ahead and actually select everything. Let's go to our inspector. And let's change our pixels per unit to 8. Although some of them will be changed to 24, but majority are 8. And then let's change our filter mode to point. Let's change our max size to 32 and change our compression to none and go ahead and apply those changes. And then specifically for the node in our wall, let's see, let's do all the walls and the pellets and this node sprite will all be set to 24 pixels per unit and we can apply those. And so that is it for all of our sprites that we'll use throughout our project. Now we can start making our stage using the sprites we've imported. So we actually need to turn some of these sprites, or at least for now our walls, into tiles so we can actually draw them onto a tile map. So first let's create our tile map. So let's right click in our hierarchy, 
Let's go to 2D object tile map and we'll choose a rectangular tile map. Let's go ahead and call this walls. And remember earlier we created different layers. So immediately we can mark our walls as being obstacles. And then from here, if we go to our scene view, you'll see in the bottom right, this open tile map. So if you have that object selected, you should see this pop up. Go ahead and click that. And the first thing we need to do before we can start drawing tiles in our scene is to create a palette. A palette will contain all the tiles and then you can basically like draw them, like literally you can just draw them into your scene. Um, I'm gonna create first a folder for our tiles. So we'll call that tiles. And let's go back and do that again. So select our tile map, open tile palette, and let's create a new palette. And I'm just gonna call this tile palette. Creates, we'll select our tiles folder. And then here it's empty. So now we can just drag all of our walls in here and it's going to create tiles for all of them automatically. So select all of our walls and just simply drag them in. We're going to choose where we want. It's, it's going to create new tile assets for us. We want to select where we're going to save those, which is our tiles folder, select folder, boom. And there's all of our tiles. And now we can basically select some, select whichever tile you want. You can use the brush and you can literally just draw tiles into your scene. So this is how we're going to construct the entire um, scene for our um, for our game. If we reference this image here, we basically just need to go through and draw out the entire stage. And, you know, if you want, you can make your own stage. It doesn't have to be exactly this. Um, feel free to get creative, but I'm just going to mimic the original game. All right, let's just start drawing. So we can select whatever tile we want and start drawing it. And we're just gonna map our map out our entire scene. I'm gonna have the reference image open on my side monitor so I can just follow along and make sure everything's um, aligned correctly. And a couple other things maybe before we begin is we want to make sure we're um, centering everything around our origin point or the center point, which is gonna be marked by our camera right here. And so I'm going to, for example, start with our ghost, um, with our ghost home, because I know that should, the bottom of our ghost home should be lined up basically one unit away from that. So let me find the right tile for that. I know these are the corner pieces. Um, we do need, there should be, um, yeah, here we go. So these tiles, or no, that's not correct. These ones. So yep, that, for example, marks the bottom of our ghost home. I believe there's six and yeah, we're just going to go through and do this. I'm probably going to end up fast forwarding through this just because it's a little bit tedious. Um, but you know, if you mess up, you can, there's an eraser, you can erase tiles. So utilize the various tools and just kind of start creating your level. Now that all of our walls are done, we pretty much need to do the same thing for all of our pellets. The pellets will be significantly easier though. However, our tiles we're gonna use for the pellets are gonna be a little bit different because they're not just simply going to be a sprite. We actually want an entire game object to act as our pellet because we're gonna eventually put a script on that pellet um, and a, a number of other components that are required so we can actually determine when pac-man eats the pellets but first let's just create a new tile map um, under the same grid here but this one specifically for our pellets so we can right click our grid 2d object tile map and we'll choose rectangular again this one i'm going to call pellets and i'm going to change the layer to our pellet layer now from here 
before we can add new tiles to our palette for our pellets, we need to create the prefabs first. We need to create a couple prefabs for our pellets. So first, let's just create um, an empty game object. I'm going to call this pellet, or actually I'll call it, um, yeah, yeah, we'll just call it pellet. Let's reset the transform so everything is the default. And we want to add a few components. So we're going to want to add a sprite renderer. And we will select the sprites um, for our small pellet. And then let's also add a box collider 2D. And on our box collider, we want to mark this as a trigger. You're not going to actually physically collide with the pellets. Otherwise, because that, that would actually stop Pac-Man's movement. You would like kind of hit the pellet and bounce off of it or whatever. We just want to know when we have touched the pellet, but we don't actually want the physical collisions caused by it. So we'll mark that as a trigger. And then let's go ahead and see what this looks like in our scene here. That looks fine. You can see that it fits really nicely. Um, the other thing I want to do is probably reduce the size of the hitbox here just a little bit. So this green outline is indicating the hitbox of our pellet. So I'm going to reduce this to a quarter of the size, 0.25. And that fits our pellet way more accurately. Um, cool. And so that is our base pellet. Let me reset this transform again. And now we can turn this into a prefab. Oh, and the other thing is we should probably mark this layer as a pellet. And then finally, to actually turn this into a prefab, we just need to drag it into our project. Um, I created a folder to store our prefabs. So I'll drag that in, and now we have our first pellet. Um, and then we need a second one. So we can actually duplicate this. Um, let's duplicate this. And I'm going to unpack this. So we're kind of starting fresh. A so prefab, unpack. And let's call this one power pellet. And this one's going to use a pellet large. And let's set the trans or the box collider size back to one. We can see this one in our scene. Once again, it still fits perfectly within our open space in our grid. The box collider fits it as well. So that's our power pellet. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to turn this into a prefab as well. So we have our pellet and our power pellet. And from here, we can delete them from our scene. We don't actually need them there. We can reselect our pellets tile map that we created and open up our palette again. And we can go ahead and drag in these. Well, actually, no, we're missing one step first. So we're going to have to create our own tile for this. And this is where that package comes into play, 2D tile map extras. If we right click in our project panel, we can go to create 2D tile palette or tiles, excuse me, tiles. And we specifically want to select a rule tile. So this rule tile is available because of that package we've installed. And this one I'll just call pellet or pellet tile. Um, and we're going to select that prefab that we just created in this field over here. Default game object is pellet. And so what this is going to do is when this tile is, um, you know, added to our scene, it's going to instantiate this game object for every one of them. And when, from there, we pretty much just need to do the same thing for our power pellets. Let's do that one more time. Create. 2D tiles rule tile. We'll call this power pellet tile. And we'll select our power pellet um, uh, game object or prefab there. And the other thing we want to do is on both of these, we want to turn off this default collider. Our game object itself already has a collider. So we don't need an additional one to be created for our, um, for our tile. And that should be, oh, this one didn't, there we go. So no colliders, power pellet tile, power pellet tile. You don't have to set the sprite because once again, the actual game object already has the sprite set using the sprite renderer. Um, and then now we can go back, select our pellets, open our palette, and we can drag these new um, tiles into our palette. 
Now you're unfortunately not going to see them because we haven't set the sprite here. Um, if it helps, you can set the sprite. Although I, I don't, rem I can't recall off the top of my head if if that should be unset. I believe these should be unset. Um, but if it helps, just so you can visualize them, um, then you can go for it. Just maybe make sure to delete them once you're once you're finished, kind of laying them out. But they are right here, even though you can't see anything. However, once we start drawing these into our scene, they should render. So let's go ahead and test that out. Um, the top one, I believe, was my small pellet. Yeah, and there we go. So as I draw them, you can indeed see them. And these are much easier because it's um, um, just kind of all in a straight line. There's only two different two different variations. All right, so we know our four power pellets will be two in those corners. And then we will have one there and one there. And now let me just go ahead and fill in the rest of the open space with our small pellets. I'll probably fast forward through this once again. All right, so that is all of our pellets now laid out in our scene. Um, one thing to make sure is if you accidentally draw a pellet on the same tile as one of our walls, you might not see it, but it is still technically there. Um, because we're rendering our pellets in its own tile map, it's possible that you might have some hidden pellets underneath the walls. I believe if you change the Z axis here, you should be able to double check that there, you didn't accidentally draw any beneath the walls. I say this because it'll actually be important when we start scripting our game, because at some point we're going to do a check to see if you've eaten all of the pellets. And if you accidentally draw a pellet underneath a wall, well then you'll never be able to actually finish the round because there'll be there'll always be a pellet that you can never actually eat. So just double check you didn't accidentally draw any um, unnecessary pellets. All right, we need to create one more tile map this time for our nodes, which will actually be invisible objects that the ghost when touched will determine they're they're going to use those to then determine what direction to go next so let's go ahead and right click our grid 2d object tile map rectangular we'll call this one nodes we'll set our layer to node and then we need to do essentially the same thing we did for our pellets which is to create a prefab so let's go ahead and right click in our scene create an empty game object i'm going to call this node i'm going to set the layer to node I'm going to reset the transform and then let's add some components. So, um, actually all we really need is a box collider 2d marked as a trigger. Cause we don't want physical collisions. We just want to know when our ghost has touched that object. I am going to reduce the size to half those so 0.5. And that's it in terms of our game object. These, once again, these are actually just going to be invisible objects. Although I will show, I'm going to show us how we can still debug and visualize them while we create them. But for the actual game, you won't see them. Um, but let's go ahead and finish creating our prefab. So we'll just drag that into our prefabs folder. And there's our node prefab. And now we can create a tile for that prefab or with that prefab. So just like we did for our pellets, we're going to right click, create. 2d tiles rule tile i'll call this node tile and we're going to select the prefab we just created and this is where we will set our sprite this time um, we're going to say the default sprite is our node sprite and once again you're we're going to turn off um, we're going to end up turning off the tile map renderer for this for the actual finished game but just for now as we create them and we, if we want to debug I have added the sprite so we can see them. And you know what? Now thinking about it, the reason why we don't want to set the sprites for our pellets is because once we start scripting our game, as Pac-Man eats a pellet, that pellet will be deactivated. 
but if we set the sprite here it's still going to render that sprite even if we turn off the game object that is instantiated and so yeah we for sure 100 percent do not want to set our sprite for our pellets like i said previously the actual sprite is part of the game object um, but for our nodes we can set it now um, and then as we create them in our scene, we can visualize them, but we'll eventually turn off the renderer. Let's go ahead and start drawing these in. Um, so let's open our palette. We selected our nodes tile map. We open our palette. We can now bring this into our palette here. I'm going to put it there. If you remember, I added our palettes are these, this top and bottom one here. And so right below that is our node. Let's select that. And we're going to basically draw a node at every intersection point or every point where a ghost could potentially change directions. We're going to draw a node there. Let's go ahead and just quickly do this. Every single point where a ghost can um, change direction. So once again, I'm going to fast forward through this just to save time. All right, I think I got all of them. Hopefully I didn't miss any, but once again, we should have a node everywhere that you could make a turn. Um, and so every time a ghost touches one of these nodes, the ghost will then determine which direction to go next. So it's just like a little network of nodes here that will base our ghost movement off of. Um, yeah, I think I got all of them. Um, if not, no big deal. We can always go back and add more if we need to, but that should be good for now. All right, now that we have all of our tile maps created, we can actually begin scripting our game. So we're going to start with our game manager script, which is going to maintain the overall state of our game. Things like starting a new round, game over, score, lives, that kind of stuff. So let's create first an empty game object called game manager. Game manager, let me close this. Let's reset the transform, although it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm gonna drag that to the top. And this is gonna be basically an empty game object that exists in our scene that will contain our game manager script. Um, let me turn off our nodes. I can go to our nodes and just turn off the renderer. Once again, this is just kind of for debugging purposes um, if we need to visualize them, but for the actual game, they will be turned off. Um, also, I just realized I spelled this wrong. Game manager. Okay. Let's go ahead and create our first script. But first, I'm going to create a folder called scripts. And let's create a new script here called game manager. And we're going to drag this onto our game manager object here. You can see it shows up. We can click the three dot menu, edit scripts. And this will open our editor with our script in it. By default, Unity creates a class for us with the same name as the file that inherits from mono behavior. Anything that inherits from mono behavior, we're able to actually add as a component to a game object in our editor. Um, cool. Let's go ahead and start implementing this. I like to delete all the default stuff they provide there, which we don't really need. So for our game manager, first we need to create a few variables for some of our common references to various game objects like the ghosts, Pac-Man, our pellets. Um, we're also going to need variables for score and lives, um, at least for now. And then we'll of course have various functions to kind of manage the overall state of the game. So let's create our variables here. Um, first, let's create our array of ghosts and our um, reference to Pac-Man and to our pellets. Um, now for pellets, we're going to reference it as a transform. I'll explain why in a little bit. And then finally, we want our score and lives here. These will be integers, score. Um, now I don't actually want score and lives to show in the editor. You're not in, meant to change the score and lives in the editor. 
these will get set programmatically um, you know through various game events and so what I'm going to do is say it has a public getter but a private setter right so it's public getter private setter which means that if someone needs to they can access and read what the current score is but they won't be able to set it themselves it will be set automatically through the various game events that we add um, same thing for lives here getter setter cool now if we look in the editor we can see those variables show up or at least the 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 ones that you know other than our score lives we can see those show up now there's one slight problem in that um, we want to reference these as not just generic game objects, but as, you know, a ghost and as like, we're going to have a script for a ghost and we're going to have a script for Pac-Man. And that's how we want to reference these, not just as generic game objects. So for now, I'm just going to create some placeholder scripts um, for everything in our game. Not everything, but for the common objects. So ghosts. We'll have one for Pac-Man. And I I think that's actually fine for now. We'll just worry about those two. So Ghost and Pac-Man. And so here, instead of just referencing them as game objects, we can reference them specifically as Ghost and specifically, oops, specifically as Pac-Man. Cool. All right, now from here, let's start adding our functions we need. Um, so first when the game starts, so start is a function Unity is going to call automatically the very first frame that this script is running on a game object. Um, when our game starts, we want to start a new game. So we can have a function called new game that will be called from start. In new game, we want to set our score and lives back to their defaults and we want to reset the state of our objects here. Um, so first let's add those functions, set score, and we'll pass in the score we want to set. We'll assign our new value here. I'm making a function for this because later on when we do UI, we're going to add additional code to this function. If I was just doing this single line of code, I would not make a function for it. But like I said, we are going to add more code to these later on. So let me just get those in there. So for example, when you start a new game, we want to reset our score to zero. We want to reset our lives, let's say to three. And then we also need to reset the state of, um, of our game. We're, in other words, we kind of want to start a new round. So we can have a different function called new round and we can call that from new game. Oops. We will also call new round when you eat all of the pellets you know, that indicates, okay, you need to start a new round again. Um, in new round, we need to loop through all of our pellets and turn them back on. Um, and the, so the reason why we reference this as a transform is because it allows us to loop through all the children. So to do that, we can say for each transform pellet in this, um, in this dot pellets, this allows us to loop through every child that's a or every object that's a child of this transform which of course will be each of our individual pellets and so in here we can reset them back to true we can turn them on again because when you eat them they'll get set to false game object will become not active anymore um, and then we essentially need to do the same thing for our ghosts so we can loop through our ghosts here I is less than however many ghosts we have and we can say this dot ghost i dot game object set active to true or i'm sorry yeah yeah that's true that's correct and then same thing for pac-man pac-man game object set active to true awesome now one important thing is that if you die if pac-man dies we need to reset the ghost and pac-man but not the pellets and so we want half of this function but not the other half and so what we could do is just separate out this into different functions so for example maybe we have a function called reset state where we can take this code and put this in here and then we can call that from new round 
But now we can also call this function independently. And so, and we will, we, we will call this when Pac-Man dies, we'll reset the state of the ghost and Pac-Man, but not the pellets. It's only when you start an entirely new round where will we reset the pellets as well. And a new round of course happens when you start a new game and it will also happen when you eat all of the pellets. Um, cool, so that's kind of the, at least at the base, it, um, kind of the core of everything, that's our overall like game state or kind of the, the different flow, the different flows there. Um, but we do need a game over. So we have new game, new round, reset state. We also need a game over. Let's go ahead and add that. Um, now in here, we will display some UI, but we're gonna do the UI later. So we'll ignore that for now. Um, when you get a game over, I essentially want to just turn off all of the objects, um, or at least the Ghost and Pac-Man. So I'm going to do the same set of code here, but I'm going to set them to be false instead. That's what's going to happen on game over. We'll also do some UI, like I said, but that'll come later. Um, and that's it. Um, we of course aren't calling game over from anywhere, right? So that's maybe a problem. So where should game over be called from? Well, if Pac if Pac-Man is eaten and you are then out of lives, we need to call game over. So we should probably have some functions for those various events, such as a ghost being eaten. And we'll reference the specific ghost that was eaten as a parameter. And we will have one for when Pac-Man is eaten. Um, and we don't need to reference Pac-Man or we don't need to pass Pac-Man as a parameter because we already have a reference to Pac-Man. So we're good there. These should be public functions because they're going to be triggered from other scripts, right? They're going to be triggered from our other scripts here eventually. Um, but we can at least start to fill these out. So we know when a ghost is eaten, we want to, well, for one, we should increment our score. All right, so whatever our current score is plus some amount usually goes to worth 200 points. Now I could just hard code this and that would be fine. However, it's usually better to create a variable. Um, that way we can customize it in the editor. All right, so in our ghost script, we can have a variable called like points, for example. Maybe it defaults to 200. But now when we eventually add this script to our ghost game objects, we could, if we wanted to, change how many points they're worth. So instead of hard coding this, we'll say this that score plus however many points that ghost is worth. All right, so that's that's important. Um, for now, that's all we'll do in here. We'll definitely add on to it later, but that's good for now. And then finally, when Pac-Man is eaten, this one will have a little bit more um, impact. Um, so first we want to turn off pac-man so as soon as pac-man's eaten we want to just completely turn off pac-man that way um it can't be it can no longer move or it'll, it won't even be rendered that way it looks as though pac-man's died so we turn off pac-man then we want to decrement how many lives we have so we're going to say this salt lives minus one and then we need to check well if we're out of lives we need to call game over all right, so we can say if this dot lives is, you know, if, if you still have more than zero lives, if you, if you still have lives, we can start a new round um, or not a new round, excuse me, not a new round, but we can just reset the state of our ghost and Pac-Man because we don't want to reset the pellets when you die. Only we, yeah, we, the pellets still remain after dying. So we can start a new round if you still have lives remaining. Otherwise, it's a game over. Oops, game over. Now, one thing I want to do is I don't want to start. Oh, I did. I just made that same mistake. I literally just said not a new round. Instead, we want to reset the state. So we we want to only reset the ghost and Pac-Man. We don't want to um, reset the pellets when you die. Um, now, one problem here is that I don't actually want to call reset state immediately upon Pac-Man being eaten. I want a little bit of a grace period between Pac-Man dying and then the and then the round resetting. And so here, 
what I can do is I can say invoke and this allows us to invoke a method after some amount of seconds and I have to reference the, the function I want to invoke by its name so I can say name of reset round or reset state you know let's call that function I kind of like that better let's call it no that might be confusing I was gonna say let's call it reset round but that's maybe confusing with new round um so we'll keep it it's fine so invoke reset state after let's say three seconds right so we're gonna wait three seconds between pac-man dying and actually resetting the state of that round um just to give it a little bit of a grace period there and that should be good for now there will definitely be a little bit more we add to our game manager for example when a pellet is eaten right when a pellet is eaten we also need to increase our score um then we need to check for how many um, if there's any pellets remaining we're going to do all the eating of pellets later as its own section um, but this for now is at least worth something um, we're certainly we're going to add more to what happens when a ghost is eaten we need to do ui but this is at least a very solid starting point Now in our editor here, we should probably assign these references. Um, although we can't assign our ghosts or Pac-Man because those objects don't exist yet, but we can at least assign our pellets here. So we're gonna find our pellets object here. It's the one that has the tile map component on it. And we're gonna drag that in as a reference there. And that should be good. Um, oh, and one thing I just thought of actually, we did miss one small thing let's say you eventually get a game over we need a way of starting a new game again so right now we only start a new game when the basically when the game is started but we also need to be able to start a new game after you get a game over and so for example a lot of games might do like press any key to play again right something along those lines so we can implement that actually pretty easily let's add an update function update is going to be called automatically by unity every frame the game is running and this is where you would check for input so we can say if input dot any key down so literally unity has this already built in where you can just check that you've pressed anything you could make this a specific key if you wanted so you could say if input dot get key down and then you can provide the key code you want so let's say maybe you wanted to do like return or like the enter key right that's an option too. It's up to you, but I'm just gonna stick with any key down just cause it's simpler. And so if you press any key, well then we can start a new game. However, we only want to do this if you're actually in a game over state. So we need to check if this.lives is less than or equal to zero, that indicates we have a game over and then we can check for input. And if so, we start a new game and that's it. So that's good for now in terms of our game manager. All right, let's go ahead and actually create our Pac-Man game object. You can start by creating an empty game object in our hierarchy. We'll call this Pac-Man. We want to set our layer to Pac-Man. That'll be important. Let's reset the transform for now. And let's add um, various components for Pac-Man. So one, we're gonna need our sprite renderer. And here we can choose our sprite. Now there will be multiple sprites because Pac-Man will be animated. So we'll handle that as well. But for now, let's just stick with, uh, there's only three for the just normal Pac-Man uh, animation. Let's just pick the middle one. And then let's see what else. We want to add a rigid body, 2D. Um, a rigid body will turn this into a physics object. The physics, um, by making this a physics object, that of course means the physics engine is actually going to simulate physics and movement and such on Pac-Man. And importantly, the physics engine is what determines collisions. And so we need to know the collision data um, to trigger various events. So we definitely want to mark that or add um, a rigid body to our object here. We do want to change some of these properties, for example, no drag linear drag is zero because with drag it's going to cause pac-man to come to a stop as it moves we want pac-man to always be continuously moving 
angular drag we can also set to zero that's gonna have to do that deals more with rotation which we don't actually care about so because we don't care about rotation we can actually go on to constraints and just freeze the rotation um we we will rotate or pac-man will rotate but we're going to rotate pac-man ourselves we don't want pack we don't want the rotation of pac-man to be simulated through the physics engine um and finally we want to turn off gravity there's no actual gravity in pac-man so we're going to set that to zero as well awesome um let's go ahead and position pac-man before we move on that way we can actually see pac-man so for one i want to change the z index here or not index but the z position in 2d games the z position is going to determine the draw order for example if i make this negative five you notice now i can see pac-man show up because it's drawing that first basically the lower the number the sooner it gets drawn or well i guess it would be the opposite but but yeah, I, we want to make this negative to make Pac-Man actually render on top. Um, so now we can see Pac-Man. Let's position Pac-Man at the default spot, which is down here. Um, negative. And we want to make sure Pac-Man's perfectly lined up with um, within this empty space. So this should be exactly negative 9.5. If, you know, assuming you followed everything else so far, it'll be that. But it may be slightly different for you just make sure pac-man perfectly lines up in between the walls here um great and i just realized too there's actually not supposed to be two pellets right there i guess we can just very quickly get rid of those we just go to our pellets open tile palette select our eraser and let's just erase those two pellets right there they don't they don't actually spawn right there on top of pac-man or beneath pac-man um, okay, let's continue with Pac-Man here. Let's add a circle collider 2D. This is going to define the shape of Pac-Man um, or the, the collidable shape of Pac-Man. Um, so you can see it show up there. We actually do want to change the size of this. Anywhere you see the black here on the walls, that will become a collider that um, you'll collide with. And so you'll notice now technically our the green outline here is representing our circle collider that would be overlapping the collision zones of the walls so it's interesting because like visually pac-man fits perfectly within that space but in terms of the collisions the collisions will be defined by the all the black outlines here um and so we want to make sure our our circle fits within that space and so i think just by doing 0 0.5 will fit perfectly All right yeah so 0 0.5 it fits perfectly in that space um great so circle collider let's see what else um we have our pac-man script we haven't done anything with it but we have that as a placeholder so we can drag that onto pac-man of course and I think that's it for now, actually. So there is Pac-Man, great. And if we play our game, nothing is going to really happen. So that's fine. We do get some errors because our game manager is missing some references, right? For example, there's ghosts here, zero. And it was also expecting a reference to Pac-Man. So now that we have Pac-Man, we can establish that reference. If we run our game again, we shouldn't get that same error anymore which we don't, great. So the game is technically running. Obviously nothing's happened because we haven't scripted anything yet, but our game runs, no errors. Um, let's go ahead and animate Pac-Man, right? So we want um, the sprites here to basically loop through um, a sequence of sprites. So we can create a script for that. And we're gonna reuse the script for pretty much all of our, all of our objects. So we're gonna create a generic script that we can use on all of our all of our various objects. So let's create this. We'll call this animated sprite. Let's go ahead and open that up. I'm gonna delete everything by default here. Um, awesome. So to animate the sprite, basically all we need to do is loop through. Um, or yeah, not loop through. 
we just need to change the sprite that's currently being rendered in the sprite renderer that's really it and then we just need to kind of iterate that over and over again and so first we're going to need a reference to the sprite renderer that we want to set the sprite on so we'll say sprite renderer i'm just going to call it sprite renderer i'm going to make this a public getter with a private setter um let me exp uh, let me i'll explain that further in a second but to establish this reference we know it's going to be part of our animated sprite here even there's actually a way in unity you could require like in order to have an animated sprite you must have a sprite render you can actually do that by saying um require component and then the type of component you want to render or require so we can say sprite render like this is like one way you can say that you 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 can't have an animated sprite unless there's also a sprite renderer on that same object, um, and so we still need to assign um, a value to this, and so we'll do that in our awake function, which is another function Unity calls automatically, essentially when this um, when this object is initialized, and this is where we can just simply say get component, and then the type of component we want to get just sprite render and there you go and we can rely that this will always rely on that this is always going to be successful because we're saying this script requires a sprite render um, and then the reason why i made it a public getter but a private setter is because it's possible that from other scripts you might reference the animated sprite and if you wanted to also then reference the sprite render it just makes it easy um, rather than having to get component all the time. Um, so you'll see me do this a lot more throughout the remainder of this of this project. Okay, now that we have our sprite renderer, we also just need an array of sprites that we will loop through. Right? So we can just say array of sprites. We'll just say call these sprites. Um, awesome. And then we want to essentially have some amount of time between each sprite so like we need a way of saying wait you know wait this amount of seconds before it switches to the next sprite so we can have a variable called maybe animation time and let's default this to a quarter of a second so every quarter second it's going to in increment to the next sprite um we need a way of knowing which which index we're currently on that way when we we can actually increment that and keep track of it so i'm going to call this animation frame this is another property that i want you know you might want people to be able to read this information but they won't be able to set it only this class can actually set this value this class is the one managing this but sometimes it's useful that other scripts might want to know they might want to read this um, so this once again just as a common thing i'm going to do and then finally we can have a boolean to say if this should loop or not maybe for some sprites um or some animations we don't want it to loop but i think for pac-man most of our animations are going to loop continuously so we'll default that to true but it's an option at least now from here we can basically do our animation and so really all we need to do is take our animation frame and increment it every you know quarter of a second or whatever this is set to so a simple way we can do this is to add our start function and on start we're going to say invoke repeating so in other words this is going to invoke some function every x amount of seconds we're gonna um, we need the function we need to actually invoke so first let's create a function called advance maybe that's fine so that's going to be the function we repeatedly call advance and we're going to call this every you know whatever our animation time is set to um, and there's actually we need to set this twice there's the initial amount of time you want to wait and then there's the amount of time every time thereafter um, which it'll just be the same so we just pass pass both of those in there so in our advance here this is where we will increment our frame then we need to check to see if it needs the loop so if our animation frame is the very last one 
So if it's uh, if it's greater than or equal to the length of our sprites, well, that means you've overflowed, um, and we need to re we need to loop back around or wrap back around to zero again. But we should only do that if you've marked this animation to be looping. And so if it is looping and you've overflown or overflowed, then we want to wrap back to zero. And then finally, we just need to update the sprite on our renderer. But just to be safe, let's make sure that um, we're not going to cause any errors by checking that our animation frame is within the appropriate range of our array there. So we can make sure our index here needs to at least be zero and it needs to be less than whatever the length of our sprites are. Sprites.length. This is so we're just we're just guarding to make sure that we're never gonna get an index out of range exception. And finally we can set our sprite, sprite render dot sprite equals this dot sprite, so our array, and then whatever our current animation frame is. And that's it. That's all we need to do for our animated sprite. Um, you know what? I will do one other thing, which is if let's say let, let's say you turn off the sprite renderer we don't want to animate we don't want it to continue the animation if the sprite renderer is disabled so we can check if it's not enabled we're just going to bail we're just going to return immediately and not do anything and now we're good on that um i think we could add a restart function so maybe you want a way to restart the animation back to zero. So basically, we just say restart. And what we can do is actually just, we could just say zero, but then we have to re add the code to set the sprite. What we can do is say negative one and then call our advance, which of course is going to increment it. And so it makes sense. Um, cool. So negative one, advance. That's how we can just simply restart if we want to. Let's go ahead and test this out. So let's go ahead and add that script to Pac-Man here. So we can add our animated sprite. We need to provide the sprites we want to animate. So for Pac-Man, there's gonna be three of them. And we're gonna say, you know what? It'll actually be five of them. Cause we're gonna start at the middle one. And then from there you go to three. And then you go back to the middle one and then you go to the closed one and then it'll loop around back to two yes yeah, so we need four actually so it goes two three two one and then the loop and continue um and then the animation time is a quarter of a second that we might need to play around with that might need to be um, um increased but here yeah here we're playing the game and we can see pac-man animating now yeah it's definitely a little slow so i'm actually gonna just cut this in half so let's do one two five an eighth of a second yeah that feels pretty good that feels a little bit more realistic or accurate to the, to the original game and awesome there we go so there's pac-man and animated sprites all right, now let's focus on getting Pac-Man to actually be able to move around. Just like we did for our animated sprite, where we made that sort of a more generic script that we can then reuse for multiple objects, we're going to do the same thing for movement. The kind of underlying movement of both Pac-Man and the ghosts are the same. The Their decision-making around how they change direction is definitely different, but the actual physical movement of those objects is really the same. And so we're going to have a new script called movement, or we'll just call it movement. Um, and we, we can reuse this for both. Um, but for now, we'll just focus on Pac-Man. Let's go ahead and add this script to Pac-Man. Let's drag that over there. I also just noticed that we have this node um, object still sitting around in our scene. We made, we turned this into a prefab. And so now that we have that as a prefab, we definitely want to remove this from our scene. And um, also there's an empty game object here. They don't care about that anymore either. So just a little clean up there. Um, cool. Let's go ahead and focus on our movement script now. Um, so I'm going to delete all this to start. And... I'm going to say to 
move an object, you require a rigid body, right? So we're gonna actually move our object through the rigid body and thus this script really only can function if a rigid body exists. We can add that requirement there, which now means that we can reference the rigid body and get a component. We can get the component to it without any issue. Um, public getter, private setter, just like we've done for other things. Um, now, this is not required. You don't actually have to do this. Um, I just find it to be a good practice in, in some cases. Um, here you'll see that we have a warning saying that our script here or movement.rigidbody hides an inherited member. member. So essentially there's already a variable with this exact same name that's defined in some of the um, base classes that we're inheriting from. However, that property is actually completely obsolete. It's really, really old from way back like Unity 4 or 5. Um, and so we can fix this in two ways. We could just choose a different name. That way there's no conflict. Or we can say, you know what, intentionally we, we want to hide the underlying um, member especially considering it's obsolete you know so to, to suppress this warning we can actually put the new keyword in there which is telling it hey we we intentionally want to hide that other property with the same name and so if you don't like that then just give it a different name that's totally totally fine as well um, so we'll assign this reference in awake, just like we do for everything else. Um, rigid body, get component, rigid body, 2D. You almost always will establish references to other objects in awake, at least other components that exist on the same object. Um, now we need a number of variables that we will use as customization. Um, Kind of different like movement settings per se so for example speed right and let's default our speed to eight um we can have speed multiplier which will just be one um, initially which essentially has no effect if you multiply something by one it does nothing um, vector two for our initial direction so every object might have a different initial direction and then finally, we need something called a layer mask, which will allow us to selectively choose which layers we want to do raycasts on. We're gonna be doing raycasts to determine when um, the object is, like if you can't move in a direction if you're, you know, colliding with a wall. If there's a wall above you and you try to move up, well then you can't. And so, we need to perform some raycasts and this is saying only check these layers um, for those raycasts so i'm going to call this obstacle layer and if you remember we created a layer in our project called obstacle so basically we're going to say only check that layer for raycasts we don't care about anything else we just care that you know pac-man and the ghosts collide with the walls of the obstacles uh, cool. And then so those are the things we can customize. And then we also just need whatever we need our state variables, whatever our current movement state is. So we of course need to know what direction we are currently moving. Factor two. This can be a public getter, private setter. It can be very useful for other scripts to be able to read the direction of the object, but this script will be the one who sets it and manages it. So that's why we're making it a private setter. And we also want next direction. One thing that's very important in Pac-Man is that you can sort of queue, queue up your movements. Um, um, if you're, let's say you're moving to the right and you press up, but there's a wall right above you, you can't then move up. Um, but we want it to make it so then Pac-Man will automatically move up as soon as there's an opening. Um, this is actually very important in Pac-Man because otherwise you would, you would have to be very, very precise about when you press your inputs to change direction based on, you know, the position of Pac-Man because you're like perfectly fitting within these, um, you know, kind of corridors. 
And so that's where it's it's just very important that we kind of queue up and, and keep track of the direction you're trying to move in next. That way it can just kind of happen automatically as you move. It just makes the movement way more responsive and, and, and fluid. So, um, so yeah, so we have next direction there. And finally, we want to keep track of our starting position, which is going to be a vector three. Um, this way we can reset the position um, whenever our game state is reset. We want to move back to this position. So we can set that initial starting position in awake as well. Just set it to whatever our current transforms position is. And then finally here, we can start implementing our movement logic. Um, so when we start, we want to make sure we're resetting our state to be based on our variables here. So for example, our direction should get set to whatever our initial direction is and a number of other things. So let's actually have a public function called reset state because we'll call this from other places as well, such as our game manager. Um, but we also want to call this when the script first starts. So to reset the state, we want to kind of set all of our variables back to their initial values and apply any settings we need to. So speed multiplier is just going to be one. Our direction should be set to whatever our initial direction is. Our next direction should be cleared or reset. And to do that, we'll just set it to zero. Our transforms position should be reset to our starting position. We want to make sure our rigid body is not marked as kinematic. So we'll set that to false. This will be used for ghosts. So when the ghosts exit the little ghost home, we have to turn the rigid bodies to be kinematic. That, that way they can pass through the walls without collision. Um, so we want to make sure we set that back to false. And then finally, yeah, we just want to make sure our script is enabled, of course, because there will be moments where we might disable movement. And so when if we reset state, we want to turn that back on. All right, now in terms of actual movement, actually applying and moving our object, we're going to do that through fixed update. So fixed update, very importantly, is um, called automatically by Unity at a fixed time step, at a fixed time interval. Um, this is this varies from the normal update function, which happens every single frame. But that means it's frame dependent. Some people might play the game with a really high frame rate. Some people might play with a really low frame rate, depending on how good their computer is. If we do that, if we do physics in that, it's going to be very inconsistent. And so physics, you almost always do in fixed update that way it's consistent it happens at a fixed time step um, so yeah this is where we're actually going to apply movement so all we need to do is access our rigid body and move positions we just need to move our object to a new position so we need to calculate what that position is so we can grab our current position rigid body that position then we can calculate how much we want to translate and this is going to be the direction we're moving times our speed, times our speed multiplier. And then we also need to account for um, time. Otherwise, the object's going to move way too quickly. So we need to say times time dot fixed delta time. Um, oftentimes, it, you know, if you've if you've made other Unity games, you would probably you're probably used to using time dot delta time in normal update. Because we're in fixed update, we want to use fixed delta time. And then here, so we can move our position of our rigid body, our current position, plus whatever tra the translation is there. And that's good. Now, one thing we need to do is have a way to change directions or to set, set the direction we want to move in. And so we'll have a public function here called set direction. You'll pass in the direction you want to move. And this will assign the new value. And so, once again, our movement script here is going to be reused for both Pac-Man and our ghosts. And so, how they determine what direction they move will be will be variable. It'll vary based on based on each of those. Pac-Man will set the direction based on user input. The ghost will set the direction based on their AI behaviors. 
So that's why we're going to have this be a public function. Now, the thing is, we only want to set the direction if we can actually move in that direction. If we try to move in that direction and that tile is occupied, well, then we can't move in that direction. So we need to check for that. Um, to check to see if that if the tile in that direction is occupied, we'll go ahead and add a new function that's going to return a Boolean. So it's going to return true or false. We'll just call this occupied. Um, we're going to pass in the direction that we're trying to move in. And this is where we can do our raycast. Um, so we need to store our raycast hit data in an object or in a, in a variable here. We'll just use it's just called hit. And now we can perform our raycast saying physics 2D um, and rake. Now, so we're not actually going to do a raycast. We're going to do a box cast. Specifically, a box cast. Um, the reason for that is because let's say Pac Man's right on the edge here. The position of our object is in the center of Pac Man. So if we did a raycast, it would just be a straight line going, let's say, down. Technically, then it would look like, yes, there it's not occupied. You can move in that direction. But we actually shouldn't be able to move in that direction because if we did, you would clip with the wall here. You would still collide with the wall. And so we want to do a box cast. That way it checks like this entire space. That way it, it ensures that you are actually are like properly positioned to make that turn. Um, the other important thing you'll see once we write the code for it is that we don't, we're going to have to specify the size of the box. And we don't want the size of the box to be the exact size of the corridor because otherwise it's going to technically be scraping the sides which would be considered colliding which would then make it look like you can't move in that direction so in our code you'll see we're going to make the size of our box slightly smaller that way it fits within the space but it still gives us a good range of motion um, or it gives us it's more accurate to um, whether you can properly move that direction or not. Um, let me reset Pac-Man before I forget. So reset Pac-Man. All right, so let's finish implementing this. So we're gonna do a box cast. And here we need to provide the position um, you want to do it from. So our object's position. We need to provide the size of the box as I just mentioned. So this will be vector 2.1, but then we're gonna scale it by like 75%. So slightly smaller than one unit. The angle doesn't matter. Um, the direction we want to perform the cast in, so that's the direction we're trying to move in. The distance here will be 1.5. And the reason for this is because we want to check one full unit over. So that would just be one, so one full unit over. But because our box cast starts at the position of our object, the position of our object is actually the center of it. And so we want to go half a unit over from the center to get it to the edge and then one more unit to check the next tile. So 1.5 there will give us the best results. And finally, this is where our obstacle layer will come into play. We're going to say we're only going to check the box cast on the obstacle layer, nothing else. We only care um, when when it comes to changing direction. We only care if you're colliding with the walls, the obstacles, not like pellets or anything like that. So that gives us our hit information, which we can then determine if it's occupied if the collider is not null. All right. So if you hit something, the collider will be set here. It even says the collider hit by the ray. If you hit something, there will be a collider. It won't be null. If you don't hit something, well, collider will be null, which indicates that it's not occupied. So finally, we can go back to our set direction here and we can say if we're not occupied, if or the, if, yeah, if the tile in that direction is not occupied, well, then we can set our new direction. So we can say this dot direction equals direction. And anytime you change direction, we want to clear out our queued up direction here. So we can just set that back to zero. And if that tile is occupied, well, then we want to queue up our direction. So we won't set it to be our current one, but we'll queue it up. This way it'll try to, we, there's a little bit more code we need to write, but it's gonna automatically try to move in this next direction. 
um, until it can. And so once again, this is important. Let's say as you're moving to the right, if I press down, right now I wouldn't be able to go down because there's a wall there. But then it will get set to be my next direction. And as Pac-Man continues to move, as soon as you can move down, then Pac-Man automatically will. And this is very important because otherwise it would require very precise inputs as to when you can actually um, change direction. Um, so it's a subtle thing that you might not realize is happening if you've played Pac-Man, but it's actually quite important. And without it, you would very much, you would very much feel that something isn't right. Um, cool. Um, there's one more thing I want to do here, though, is there are some times when we want to force the direction to be set. Um, even if technically, um, even if technically the tile is occupied, you sometimes we want to force it anyways. This is more important for our ghosts later on. Pac-Man, I don't think we'll ever use that, but we can add an optional parameter here, maybe called forced. It'll be defaulted to false, but let's say if if it's not occupied or you decide that it should be forced let me do this the other way if you say yeah like force the direction change or that tile is you know not occupied then we can go ahead and set it otherwise we'll queue it up so this will come into play later on um, okay and finally we're, we need one more thing which is we need to continuously try to move in this next direction if if you've set one so in our normal update function here, we can check if our next direction is not zero. So if you've actually set a next direction, we're just going to try to set that now as our current direction. So it's going to try every single frame to, to go in that direction um, until it can. And as soon as it can, then it'll actually get set. But if it continues to be occupied, then then, you know, nothing's going to happen. But this is this is the finish off that important part of Pac-Man, which is kind of queuing up your next direction. So, so that's it in terms of our movement script. It's a generic script we can now reuse on various objects, um, mainly Pac-Man and the ghosts. Um, but let's go ahead and test this out. Um, let's make sure we set our variables here. So speed is eight, multiplier is one. Let's make sure our initial direction for Pac-Man is one in the X, so that would be moving to the right. And our obstacle layer, we want to make sure we set that to our obstacle layer that we created at the start of our start of the video. Um, and then we can try this out. Let's just play it and see what happens. So here, there we go. I move to the right. As soon as I hit a wall, I hit a wall. Um, now, I just realized something though. I made one mistake and I cheated a little bit and I did something when I wasn't recording that I didn't mean to do. Um, so let me undo that and let me explain one thing that's important. So normally speaking, if you just followed along exactly with the video, yours would look like this. Boom, Pac-Man just goes straight through the walls. And you might ask, okay, well, why? Why is that? Well, that's because our walls here don't actually have colliders on them we need to add a collider to all of our walls. And we actually can do this very easily by simply adding a new component to our um, on the same object as our wall tile map. All we need to do is add a tile map collider 2D. As soon as we add that, you'll see automatically it adds colliders to all of those objects, which is nice and easy. The other thing we should do is go to all of our tiles here Let's select all of our walls and we can change the collider type from sprite to grid. This is going to make sure it generates a collider based on the, the grid rather than the specific sprite. Now with these particular sprites, it ends up being the exact same thing. But just in case, if you are using your own custom sprites, this should probably be set to grid. That way everything um, is uniform with, you know, everything stays uniform um, and finally there's one other thing we need to do which um, is hard to notice but 
because pac-man is technically colliding with the walls at all times because because like pac-man is perfectly you might have even just saw it there was like a little weird like slowdown and then pac-man sped up again it was really quick you might have missed it but pac-man's technically always colliding with the walls because it perfectly fits within this open space and so when you're scraping against the walls it's creating friction and that friction is then slowing you down um, so we want to add a physics material to our tile map collider to remove friction. That way you never get slowed down as you sort of scrape against the walls. Um, and this is another thing I, I did um, unintentionally when I wasn't recording. And so I already have the physics material here. But let me delete it and I'll show you how that's done. I created a folder called physics. I can right click, create 2D physics material 2D. And we can just call this like zero friction, for example. And then we just simply need to change the one property here in the inspector to zero, which says okay, no friction. And now we can assign that to our walls um, tile map collider. Boom, throw that on there. And Pac-Man now won't slow down, or the ghosts won't slow down as I sort of scrape against the walls. That would be a lot more apparent um, once we can actually change direction. Um, but trust me that that will be pretty important. All right, well, so now we do, we need to be able to change direction. So we can implement our inputs um, for Pac-Man pretty simply, just a few lines of code. And we'll do this in our, specifically in our Pac-Man script. So let's go ahead and open that up. Let me just double check that I'm still recording. Yes, I am, good. Okay, so let's open our Pac-Man script up delete everything or at least that's what I prefer to do and to check for input we need to implement our update function it's typically where you check for input is in update so let's go ahead and add that and really all we need to do is reference our movement script and just call our set direction every time you press a certain input right so First, we need to establish a reference to um, to that movement um, script that we can, we can call that function on it. So let's go ahead and add that here. Public movement movement. I'm going to make this one again. Public getter private setter. Um, then we'll assign that in awake just like we've done before. This dot movement equals get component movement. If I want, I can require this. Don't have to do this, but I'm going to. And then, yeah, and now we can access the functions we need to. So our goal is to say set direction and then based on whatever input we press, right? So check for input, we can say if input.get key down, for example, and then we can choose which key we want. So key code dot W, you know, if we want to do W, A, S, and D, or we could say input get key down key code dot maybe, maybe we want to do the arrow keys so that's we can do both if that's the case then we say set direction to be up vector 2 dot up and then at this point we're basically just going to copy this over and over again else if else if else if and then we'll just change these keys we'll say s and down arrow go down we'll say a and left arrow to go left and then d and right arrow or or right arrow to go right and that should be good um let's go ahead and test this out um yeah let's go ahead and test this out let that reload and compile let's play our game we should be able to just navigate around our maze now if it works Yep, there we go. Pac-Man's not rotating, so we'll handle that. That just requires an extra two lines of code. But we can move around. And I know you can't really feel it, or you can't really tell from just watching a video, but I can sort of preemptively press an input before I actually get to the turn. Right, so I'm gonna press up now, and it already it will then automatically goes up as soon as Pac-Man can. So this just once again makes makes the movement way more responsive um, and fluid. 
Let's finish this off by making sure Pac-Man actually rotates in the direction we're moving. So this is just a little bit of math here. We need to calculate the angle um, of our direction and then just rotate based on that angle. So our angle here, we're going to use um, math F at a tan 2. If you remember back to maybe some of your math, um, to some of your math classes in high school. Um, so this dot movement direction dot y, and then this dot movement direction dot x. Okay, and then so that's the angle of the movement direction we're going in, and now we just need to assign this to our rotation. So this dot transform dot rotation equals. And rotations are usually represented with quaternions. So we can say quaternion.angle axis. This is just a function that allows us to create a rotation. Um, it, yeah, it creates a rotation which rotates some amount of degrees around whichever axis we pick. So this is the angle we calculated. And the ax, oh, and then we need to convert it to, um, this returns radians. We need to convert this to degrees. So we can multiply this by math f rad or radians two degrees rad two two d e g and then finally the axis we actually want to rotate around which for us is our forward axis or our our z axis axis i can never say that word properly um so that's it there's our rotation hopefully let's test it out real quick Let that recompile play our game Oh, I might have, yep, let's try that again. Replay our game. And now every time, oh, okay, there we go. Yep, there we go. So as I move and change directions now, I can, our Pac-Man's rotating properly. Good, I can go left and right, up and down. Everything works perfectly. So that completes Pac-Man movement. Now that we have Pac-Man moving around, one thing we need to do is make sure Pac-Man can go through these little tunnels or passages um, as Pac-Man goes, for example, on the right here, he should then come out the other side and vice versa. So let's go ahead and implement that. It's actually pretty easy overall. Um, what we're going to need to do, though, is add a little collider, a little hitbox, a trigger that um, we can detect when Pac-Man or the ghost do. This will work for the ghosts as well. We can detect when one of the objects um, triggers that or enters that zone, and then we'll just basically change their position to be the other side. Let's go ahead and go to our, our walls game object here and let's go ahead and create some new um, some new children here. So I'm gonna create an empty child here. We're gonna need four of them. We're gonna need basically two colliders, two little hitboxes, and then two other game objects that will represent the position you'll move to. So first, for example, I'm gonna call this you know passage left. This will have a box collider 2D. It's gonna be a trigger and we'll position this right on the edge here. So, and it should, the coordinates should be, you know, kind of rounded to half units. So 14.5 and negative 0.5. Great. Um, and then same thing, let's duplicate this. Oops, not rename, duplicate. Call this passage right. We're just going to flip that to positive. And so there's our patch left, passage right. So those are the little zones that when you enter them, then that tells us, okay, we need to move to the other side. Now we need to add two other empty game objects to the position that we want to move the object to. We don't want to move the object on top of this other collider. Otherwise they're just going to, in, they're just going to const, they're just going to go back and forth, back and forth, like instantly, um, which wouldn't work. So we need to, the position they actually move to when flipping needs to be offset a little bit. So these will just be empty game objects um, that'll be positioned right on the edge here. So it's same Y, but the, the X will be offset by one unit. We'll call this connection um, left and then duplicate that. Call this connection right and we'll just flip it to positive. So there's our four objects. Um, now we just need to write our script, which is actually a very simple script. I'll just call this passage. I'm gonna add this script to both of our passage game objects here. 
one that has the the box collider on it and make sure we mark that as a trigger passage and then here all we really need to do is determine when you actually collide um, with that um, trigger so do that we just have to implement a function unity provides to us which is called on trigger enter 2d and then it passes back the collider that you have um, triggered and so in here, we just need to basically say, you know, move the object. So other dot transform will be the, the object that's actually colliding with the passage. So either Pac-Man or the ghosts, and we just want to change their position. So let's get, let's get the object's current position. And then we're going to change the position in the X and the Y to be the other the connection so we actually need to reference the other transform that we want to um, move to so the connection transform that's why i called them passage and connection um, so we're going to set our position x to be connection.x and position y to be um, connection.y and let me be consistent with my code here. This dot connection. Oh, and this is position. My bad. Position dot x and same thing. Position dot y. We're not setting the z because the z axis um, determines draw order. So, in theory, you could. This would just be one line of code where it's other dot transform dot position equals this got to connection dot position. We don't want to do this because this is going to change our Z position, which determines draw order, and that would potentially screw some stuff up. So we're we're kind of manually just setting the X and the Y. And let's just reassign this now to the object. So that's it. That's all the code we need for handling these passages. Um, we just need to establish those connections here. So once this recompiles, so on passage left, you should connect to connection right. On passage right, we want to reference connection left. Let's go ahead and test this out. Boom. Change to the other side. Let's go the opposite way. Boom. There we go. So nice and simple. That's a pretty easy one. Now let's go ahead and handle eating the pellets to kind of finish off all the movement of Pac-Man. So let's create a new script for our pellet. Um, let's go ahead, C sharp script. We're going to call this pellet. And we're actually going to have a different script for our power pellets. So let's create two. So, pellet and power pellet. Okay. Oh, my thing's flagging. There we go. Okay. So, we have those two scripts. Um, and let's go to our prefabs that we created earlier. And let's make sure we add those scripts to our prefab. So on our normal pellet, we're going to add pellet. To our power pellet, we're going to add power pellet. So make sure we drag in those scripts. And let's go ahead and start writing the code for these. These will also be pretty simple. There won't be a whole lot of code required here. Um, the one thing that's important, though, is that our power pellet should inherit from pellet. Right. So anything we define in pellet should also be power pellet. A power pellet is a normal pellet, and thus we should in inherit from that. And so really the only variable we need in pellet is how many points, um, how many points it's worth. That way we can increase our score. And I believe by default pellets are worth 10 points. Power pellets will, will be worth 50. So we'll have to change that in the editor, but we'll default it to 10 since that's the majority of them. And then here we need to detect when Pac-Man, you know, hits or collides with each pellet. And the pellets are just triggers. Um, we mark them as uh, the colliders as triggers. So just like we did for our passages a moment ago, we'll implement on trigger enter 2D, collider 2D other. We need to make sure that the thing we're colliding with is Pac-Man and nothing else. Only Pac-Man can eat the pellets. So just to be careful here, very simple check if other dot game object dot layer equals layer mask name to layer and we'll say Pac-Man. Oop, get rid of that space. So this is just making sure that indeed the object we're colliding with is Pac-Man. 
um then we need to eat the pellet so we'll have a function here called eat and we'll call eat now the thing is we want this function to be overridable because when you eat a power pellet it's going to be slightly different so the way we can make it so we can override this function in our um, power pellet is well first marking it as protected because that means once it's protected then we can access it from any subclasses if it's private only this class can access it if it's protected, this class and any subclasses can access it. And then we also want to mark it as virtual, which will allow us to override it. Specifically, that's what that keyword's doing. By default, though, um, we need to turn off the object. Um, so this uh, game object set active to false. Um, and you know what? I think we can just do that in our game manager. Is the other line of code we were going to write was basically we we're going to reference our game manager and say that the pellet was eaten that way the score and stuff can be increased just like kind of how we have ghost eaten pac-man eaten i know we we haven't called these anywhere yet but we will eventually we need the same thing um so actually yeah let's go ahead and create a function for this pellet eaten and we'll reference the specific pellet that was eaten same thing when um, you eat a power pellet. Okay, so power pellet. Um, now, when you eat a power pellet, we want to do anything that would happen when you eat a normal pellet should also happen when you eat a power pellet. So we can call the other function immediately. That definitely needs to happen. And then eventually there will be some extra code in here um, for changing ghost state. All right, so when you eat a power pellet, the ghosts become vulnerable, so you can then eat the ghosts. Um, but for now, um, we're good there. When you eat a pellet, we want to increase our score. So set score, this dot score, our current score, plus however many points that the pellet is worth. Um, we want to turn off the pellet, so let's do that first actually pellet game object set active to false so we want to hide it so you can no longer it one it disappears and you don't see it anymore and two so um you can't eat it again and the other thing we want to do is check if we've eaten all of the pellets once you've eaten all the pellets well we want to start um a new round so how can we do that um first i'm going to add a different function to check for this to check if you've eaten all the pellets so we can say maybe has remaining pellets um, and yeah this will return a boolean true or false and kind of like we did earlier we were able to loop through all of our pellets here we're going to kind of do the same thing we're going to loop through all of the children of our pellets transform um, and basically if there is any pellet that is active well that means we have not eaten them all um, so we can say if pellet.gameobject.active self, this is a way of checking if this game object is active. If it is, that means you haven't eaten them all. There is still some remaining pellets. So we'll return true. If you end up looping through everything and you still have, if you end up looping through everything and this has never been called, well, then that must mean you've eaten them all and there's no more active pellets. So in that case, false there is no more remaining pellets and so here now we can finally check if there are no more remaining pellets um then we need to start a new round um and kind of like we did for when pac-man was eaten we want to have a little bit of a buffer period between starting a new round um and you eating that very last pellet so we can invoke name of new round after let's say three seconds we'll keep the same grace period we did before uh, and the other thing we want to do is we should turn off pac-man i don't want pac-man to be able to be killed after you've technically already won the round and you're just waiting for it to reset so we can just turn off pac-man this dot pac-man game object set active to false that way a ghost can't come and eat you um, 
and that should be good. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we're missing. Turning off the pellet, updating our score, checking if we've eaten them all. And if you have, we start a new round. Um, power pellet, we can't finish implementing yet because we haven't implemented our ghost state. So we'll come back to that. But at least we have the code there. Uh, the other thing we might want to do is check for, um, or not check, but when you are when you eat a power pellet and then you're able to eat the ghosts um you start to build up a multiplier so the first ghost you eat will be 200 points and then the next ghost you eat will be 400 points and then 600 and then 800 and so on um until that the duration of the power pellet um finishes when, once the duration once the power pellet expires your multiplier gets reset to, to back to one again so Let's go ahead and implement that. So in our game manager, let's add a new variable here for our, you know, we'll call this ghost multiplier. Getter, public getter, private setter. We're gonna default this to one. If you times by one, it'll have, you know, no net result. Um, so ghost multiplier. Anytime you eat a ghost, we want to increase that multiplier. We just increment it. And then instead of just adding however many points the ghost is worth, we want to make sure we're multiplying this by the ghost multiplier. And I'm going to separate this into its own variable just for readability. So we can just do that. And then we say this has four plus points. Great. Now the only thing is we need to reset our multiplier once the power pellet has finished. So that will be pretty important um, and I want to flip the order of these I want to do all this other stuff first um, so to handle this yeah we need to reset our multiplier after our power pellet has finished so we need a function to reset that reset ghost multiplier and this is just simply going to set that back to one we probably should also call this in, um, I guess, reset state or new round, I suppose. It doesn't really matter, honestly. We'll just call it in reset state since that definitely gets triggered pretty much throughout everything. And um, we need to invoke this now. So we need to invoke that function after the duration of our um, power pellet is up. Now we haven't actually defined duration yet, so that's a variable we need to add to our power pellet. We can specify a duration here. I think roughly they last around eight seconds. So we'll set that as our default. We can always change it if we want. And now we will invoke reset ghost multiplier after um, our pellet's duration is, is finished. Awesome. Now, the other thing is if let's say you eat a power pellet and then you start eating some ghosts, let's say you eat another power pellet before that first one expires, your, your multiplier should still remain. And we actually want to then cancel this and start it over again every time you eat a power pellet. So all we need to do to handle that case is just add a cancel invoke. So if there's, if this timer is already in progress, it'll get canceled and then it'll start over again. And this will allow us to stack our multiplier even beyond four. Um, if you're smart about how you're managing the power pellets um, and the timing of them and, and so on. Um, so just a small thing there. So that should be good. Now we can't fully test this yet because we don't actually have our ghosts, but the code's fairly straightforward, so we'll definitely test that later on. Um, we need to now finally go back to our pellet, finish writing this. We can find our game manager and our scene to get a reference to it, and then just call that function. Pellet eaten, and we're going to pass this as the argument. Um, we need to now override that in our power pellet. Right, so we're going to override this. We're going to switch virtual to override. And now instead of saying pellet eaten, we're going to say power. Oh, did I, I, I misnamed or I didn't name this. This should be power pellet eaten. Let's fix that. So power pellet eaten. There we go. 
We're just overriding that to call a different function. Nice, and that should be it. Um, we can at least test you eating the pellets and our score increasing. Um, let's go ahead and do that. I think we can see our score if we change this to debug. Yeah, we can. So we can see if that increases as we eat the pellets. And yep, there we go. Our score has increased every time. We can eat a power pellet. Nothing happens yet because we don't have our ghosts, but it will. We do need to make sure we're changing our score. So power pellets are, let me set this back to normal. Power pellets should be worth 50 points and normal pellets are 10. So that looks good. Notice how our power pellet, because it's inheriting from pellet, it has points, but it also has its own unique property here that the normal pellet doesn't. Awesome. And obviously we want to make sure these all have box colliders set to trigger. We want to make sure the layers are set correctly. All of that we did way back in the beginning. That'll be very, you know, that's all very important to make sure now that you're properly colliding and the functions are being triggered um, as needed. So there you go. That's, that's all we need for our pellets. Now we can finally move on to our ghosts, which will be all we have left to do. Although it's probably the most complicated of everything. First, let's go ahead and just create our ghosts and um, um, create some prefabs and stuff for them. So we're going to we're going to create a base prefab that we can then create variants of for each of our individual ghosts. But first, let's just create that object, that base prefab. So let's create a new object. I'm going to reset the transform. I'm just going to call this ghost base. I'm going to make sure I set our layer to ghost. And from here, we need various components. So we're going to need a rigid body 2D. It, honestly, it's going to be very similar to our um, to Pac-Man. So actually, let me let me undo that. Let's start with our sprite renderer. And for example, we can set our sprite here to be our ghost body. So I've separated the body from the eyes because the eyes will actually change direction as you move. But we don't want to necessarily, you know, the body will animate back and forth and then we can still change the eyes separately without having to have tons and tons of variations of those sprites and then specifically it's white because then it'll allow us to change the color to anything we want here in the editor um, but our base one will just keep white um, so sprite renderer is at our rigid body 2d um, once again this the these properties should honestly be i think they'll be identical to pac-man so one mass zero linear drag zero angular drag zero gravity let's freeze the rotation and i think we're good there let's add a circle glider as well just like pac-man let's change the radius to 0 0.5 just like pac-man um let's see yep that's good and then we have our ghost script right yeah let's throw our ghost script on there let's throw our movement script on there so once again we get to reutilize this. We get to reutilize the script um, when we first created it for Pac-Man. It's going to work the same way for the ghosts. Um, I'm going to set their speed to be one less than Pac-Man. You don't have to do this. It's up to you. It's preference. But I'm going to make the ghost slightly slower than Pac-Man, just so Pac-Man has that little bit of an advantage. We're going to make sure we set our obstacle layer. And let me think. Is there anything else we need? Movement, ghost. We will have different ghost behaviors, but that'll come later. I think in terms of just the base object here, this should be good. Can we see it? Yeah, we can see our ghost there. It's kind of clipping behind everything, but that's okay. I suppose we can set our Z, Z position here so it renders on top. So we'll do negative one. That way it renders on top of everything. And Pac-Man is negative five. So Pac-Man will be rendered on top of all the ghosts. Um, so Pac-Man kind of has the priority there. And I think that's it. If we forget something, we can always go back and add it. Um, let's go ahead and drag this into our prefabs folder. And there's our ghost base. Oh, you know what? I am forgetting a bunch of things, actually. Um, so let me re-select this prefab and let me open it now. Um, and let me continue editing this. And what we're missing is like, there's going to be a number of children objects, like for the eyes and then different variations of the ghost based on its state. Um, so you're going to have its body. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm forgetting. We're not going to have the sprite renderer on the 
on the kind of parent object here because it's potentially like when the ghost is in its vulnerable state it's going to render differently so we're going to have the separate sprite renderers based on its state so we're, we can actually remove this um or this really becomes our body so we can drag this onto our body object you know it doesn't even let me so let me just remove that quick um quick fix here so we have our body we'll add a sprite renderer to it let's reassign our body there there we go that's fine let's have our eyes and we'll have a separate sprite render for this and we'll set our eyes you know pick whatever starting direction you want it doesn't really matter let's say to the right um our body as well i forgot we'll have an animated sprite so we're going to reuse that script there's going to be two variations of this which is if you might have saw that there's two body sprites so we're going to assign both of those body one and body two and our animation time should be fine yeah we'll keep that how it is this definitely should loop um that's all good our eyes won't be animated well, they will be in a sense but our eyes will be set programmatically so we'll have to write a script for that because um, it depends on the direction they're moving and then we also need another one here we need one i'm just gonna call this one blue so basically when the when you need a power pellet the ghost becomes vulnerable or frightened and it enters this like blue mode it becomes blue so that's just a completely separate sprite entirely so we'll have yeah there's ghost vulnerable blue and there's also ghost vulnerable white so we'll set that to blue this also will be animated so we'll create an animated sprite um on this there's two states just like the normal body there's one and two quarter of a second good um cool what else body eyes blue and then finally we have white we're gonna call this white so when the ghost is close to um finishing being vulnerable it flashes white so we'll have this as a separate one too sprite renderer white animated and this i believe will be so this one flashes between white and blue so we actually gonna have we're gonna have all of that in here so first we're gonna set the first two to be blue or no no it should oh yeah i think it should alternate shouldn't it i think it should alternate between so it goes like blue white blue white um so blue one then white two. Oh no that doesn't work no let's just do blue and then white that's fine yeah blue then white so it just kind of flashes between those and once again still quarter of a second time it definitely should loop um so essentially we're going to write some code later on that's going to um that's going to go between these different objects and turn some of them off and some of them on based on the current state of pac-man i think the important thing we want to do is make sure by default blue is turned off so we're going to turn off that sprite render white is turned off we're going to turn off that one now it's just our normal pac-man body and eyes and that's it so that completes our actual prefab i i created that prefab a little prematurely um so double check the parent here does not have a sprite renderer all the different sprite renderers are on are, are added as children here and that's it and then some of them are animated so there's our base prefab now we can create variants of this prefab um, for their individual ones so let me drag in um let's drag that back into our scene and all we now need to do is drag this back into our project and it's going to ask us would you like to create a new original prefab or a variant so we want a variant here all right and let's call this one um let's start with blinky so one of the ghosts name or nickname is blinky he's the red ghost um so we'll go into blinky here and we're going to change his body to red all right so he's red um i don't think any of the other sprite renders need to be changed but he's red blinky actually starts outside of the um let me yeah let me delete from the scene add that back yeah so blinky here actually starts outside of the house um he actually starts right here so let's position him right there 2.5 
and he actually starts facing to the left so i can set his initial direction to be negative one to go left oh and i need i'm doing this slightly wrong i want to make sure i'm applying these changes to the actual blinky prefab so the, the better way to do this is to actually go into blinky here and make the changes there um and then once again, he's moving to the left, so we can set his default body, or not the body, but his eyes. We can override to go left. All this is gonna change programmatically anyways, but it's just nice that they start out exactly in the right state. So that's Blinky. I think that's it for him, um, for now at least. Once we add some of the ghost behaviors, there'll be some more customization, but that should be good. Let's go ahead and delete, or no, keep him in the scene. Let's add our base again and then drag it once more into our project uh, fold or yeah, project panel, create another variant. Let's delete it from the scene, throw our variant in there. Let's call this one, um, uh, let's do Inky. I believe Inky's the cyan one. Let me just double check that real quick. Yeah, Inky's the cyan one. Um, so let's open up this prefab. His color needs to get set to cyan. Let me get the exact color real quick. I think it's just exactly cyan. Yeah, it is. So exactly cyan will be 180 hue, 100, 100. Um, he starts looking up. So let's go to his eyes and change them to be up. And he, because he's looking up, his initial direction is up. And he starts inside the cage um, to the left here. It's negative, let's see, I think this should be negative two and then negative 0 0.5. Yeah, so he's centered in the cage. He'll be on the left, there'll be one in the middle and there'll be another one on the right. So that's Inky. Next, let's create another variant um, for, oh, and let me check something. Do we want to, one thing we want to do is make sure the eyes are always on top. Um, right now they are rendering on top, but you can see in this little preview for the prefab, it's not. So to guarantee that the eyes are always on top, let's go into our base prefab. Let's go to our eyes and set the Z to negative one to make sure it's always on top. And you can see it kind of fixed it there too in the, in the prefab. Oh no, I forgot to name this as well. So let's name him Ghost Inky. All right, let's continue. Next, we need another variant. So let's drag the base, drag it back to our scene or our project um, folder prefab variant. Let's call this one Pinky. Um, so Pinky is um, obviously pink. So Pinky starts in the middle. So position will be negative 0 0.5, starts right in the middle. Pinky is always the first one to leave the, the house open up this prefab let's change the body color to pink let me get the exact color here one second um let's grab this exact color here so that you can use the same hexadecimal here for that exact color pinky starts looking down yeah pinky starts looking down uh, so let's go to the eyes change them to be down and then let's set the initial direction to match on so negative one should be good there awesome so there's pinky um is there anything else we need to do i don't think so all right now finally one more throw our base in our scene throw it back into our project panel create one more variant this one will be clyde nickname is clyde he's the orange one um it's Delete our base, throw that back in our scene. Let's open up the prefab, go to our body. We're gonna set the color to orange. Let me get the exact color again. Okay, so let's paste in this color here. So that's the hexadecimal for Clyde. You can change it if you want, it doesn't actually matter, but Clyde um, starts facing up. So we're gonna set the eyes to be up initially. We're going to um, set our direction to be up initially. And let's position Clyde to the right now. So two, negative 0 0.5, that looks good. Let me just double check one thing real quick. I wanna pull up that reference image I had 
Oh, I actually don't have it. Let me check something. Let's do a quick Google search here. Pac-Man and images. Just want to verify. Yeah, indeed that, um, indeed their position. So blue and orange start facing up. Pinky starts facing down. Blinky starts facing to the left. So all that's good. Blinky, Inky, Pinky, and Clyde. And there we go. So we have all our ghosts now. And um, technically, they actually should start moving right away because we have our movement script on them. Let's just see what happens. Yeah, so Blinky moves. These three don't move because they're sort of stuck in a sense. They're technically colliding with um, with the house here um, because th those are all colliders. But they're going to need um, a little bit of custom logic. But you can see Blinky started moving right away. Of course, he hits the wall, and we haven't written any code for him to set the new direction. But they're somewhat working. They're animated, so that's all good. And cool. So that's it for creating our ghosts and the prefabs and stuff. And then we'll get to adding their behaviors next. So the ghosts are going to have several different behaviors. Um, four behaviors in particular. They're going to have a behavior for when they're in the home. They're going to have a behavior when they're scattering around, when they're chasing Pac-Man, and finally when they are frightened. Um, now, all of these behaviors are going to inherit from a single base class. Um, that's going to have some functions for enabling and disabling the behavior. And then we'll, of course, have our ghost script here, which will kind of keep references to all the different behaviors of our ghosts. So let's go ahead and create all of those. We're going to focus on them one at a time. But first, let's just get all the base stuff in place and kind of get the placeholders in place. So we're going to want um, a script called ghost behavior. We're going to want another script called ghost home. It's not the best name, but that's okay. We're going to want another script called ghost um, scatter. We're going to want one called ghost chase. Sorry, it lags a little bit. And then finally, we want one for ghost. Um, what are we missing? Frightened. All right, so those are our four different behaviors. And so so all of those will inherit from that, um, from that base class, ghost behavior. All right, so ghost behavior, frightened inherits from ghost behavior, home, inherits from ghost behavior scatter inherits from ghost behavior and there we go cool so we have those four inheriting from ghost behavior we need to add all of those scripts now to our actual um to our actual um ghosts so we want to add it to the base prefab that way it applies to all of the ghosts automatically Let's open our ghost base prefab we can simply drag in all of those different, um, all of those different scripts. So, um, ghost home, ghost scatter, ghost chase, and ghost frightened. And we'll turn them all off by default. They're all going to be disabled because each one, well, for one, you know, they start out in different states. Um, and really, we're going to have our base ghost script kind of um, manage that. It'll turn them on and off as needed. So by default, they're all turned off. That's good. And let me go back to, let me open that up. Ghost base. I'm going to just reorganize. I'm going to move our movement up. So those are all in, in order. And now let's go ahead and start defining this, um, defining these, this base class ghost behavior, as well as our just general ghost script, which will manage everything. Um, so for ghost behavior, this is really just going to have a couple basic functions for enabling and disabling the behaviors. And we're going to mark them to be virtual so we can override them in the respective scripts as needed. So in here, 
Um, and each ghost behavior needs a reference to the actual ghost that it is part of. So we'll establish that this just like we have done before. I'm going to require that as well. You can't have a ghost behavior without a ghost. So we'll require that component. We'll assign this reference in awake. Get component, ghost, great. I'm going to disable our script immediately just in case. Um, I don't want any of the behaviors to be enabled um, immediately because we're going to have other code that handles that. And then this is where basically I just want some functions for enabling and disabling this. Now, normally speaking, you would just say this dot enable true false, but specifically you'll be able to enable behaviors for a duration. And so we're actually going to have enable, and then we're also going to have enable with a duration. And then we're going to have disable, of course. And you'll see this will make a little bit more sense as we finish implementing them. Um, but so by default, every ghost behavior is going to have their default duration, right? So we'll have a duration variable here. And so when you enable, if you just enable it without specifying duration, well, then it just uses the, um, the, the duration specified by the behavior. So we're gonna, like this enable function, we'll call this one passing in just the default duration. But for example, for the frightened state, that depends on the power pellets, right? So the power pellets define a duration. And so that's why the power pellets are going to want to say, hey, each ghost, you need to be in frightened needs to be enabled for however long the power pellet lasts. That's why we're handling it this way. So in here, um, we're gonna set our script to be on, of course. And we're going to essentially set a timer that will disable this, right? So we're going to invoke disable after whatever that duration is. And the other thing is if this were enabled a second time. So for example, if you eat a power pellet, the frightened will be enabled. If you eat another power pellet while the first one still hasn't finished, well, then it should re-enable and it should restart the timer again, just like we did in our game manager um, here. So same code, we're gonna cancel invoke to make sure it sort of resets um, every time. And then in disable, of course, we wanna set, um, set this off to false. And then we'll also cancel invoke there as well, just in case. Um, just to make sure nothing is getting called that it should be. Um, so that that's it for our just base script here. Um, we'll be overriding these. Oh, that's what I missed is we need to mark this as virtual and this is virtual. That way we can override them if needed in each of the respective um, ghost behaviors. But that's it for our base class. I can actually mark this as abstract, which makes it so you can never have a ghost behavior by itself. You can never add just ghost behavior to a to a game object. You have to you have to have a class that inherits it and then you could add ghost chase or ghost frighten or ghost home or scatter. Um, so you don't have to do that, but it's it's actually a good use case for, for this being abstract. Alright, so that's our base behavior. Now let's actually implement our just general ghost here. There won't really be any logic per se in this script. It's going to mostly just manage a lot of the different references. So all of the respective behaviors can can access the different properties it needs. The, the sprite, the movement script, the, the other behaviors, stuff like that. So we're just going to go ahead and define all of these. We're going to want the animated sprite in case you need to reference that. Um, we're going to, oh, you know what? We don't need that, just kidding. We don't even need that because there's multiple different sprites and so on, so we actually don't need that at all. Um, but we do want movement because each of the respective ghost behaviors is going to determine how the ghost moves. And so each one will set the direction differently. Um, and then basically we just want a variable for each of the respective ghost behaviors. So home, we'll just call this home. Get private set. So let me let me just duplicate this. Um, 
four times. This one will be ghost scat oops. Ghost scatter. We'll have ghost um, chase and ghost frightened. Let's name all these frightened, chase, and scatter. Uh, what else? Each ghost should define what the initial behavior is. Right, so there's these four behaviors, but the ghosts actually vary in like Blinky is going to start out in scatter mode, whereas the other three are going to start out in home. So we need a way of defining what the initial behavior is. So we can actually just say ghost behavior and then initial behavior. And this will be a public, um, a public variable, not private set or anything, because we actually need to set this in the editor. And then finally, we need a reference to the object that we're like targeting, which is really just going to be Pac-Man. But in theory, it could be anything. Um, so we want to reference the transform of whatever object we essentially want to chase, for example. Or when you're frightened, you're going to run away from this object. So, oh, I didn't mean to call this Pac-Man. I'm going to call this target. So like the target object that you're chasing or running away from. Um, it will be Pac-Man, but you know, if you want to do something creative in your game, you can you can set that differently. Now we just need to assign all of these references in awake. So, you know, this dot movement get component movement. This dot home get component home ghost home. I want to copy all these again. Chase friend scatter. So yes, yeah, so scatter ghost scatter. Um, chase, oops, chase, ghost chase, oh gosh, ghost chase, and frightened, and ghost frightened. So, we're, we're creating references for all of these, because each behavior often is going to reference other behaviors. You know, when you finish scattering, it needs a transition to chase. When you finish chasing, it needs a transition to scatter. Um, when you're frightened and get eaten, it needs to transition to home. So it's like each of the scripts will be able to reference um, each other. So that's why we're just adding them all right here. Um, finally, we need a way of resetting the ghost um, as part of our, as part of you know, you know, starting a new round and so on. Right now, all we're really doing is setting them to be active or inactive. But we need to do a little bit more than that for our ghosts um, and actually for Pac-Man as well. So really we need to create different functions or we need to create functions for each of these that actually resets their state. So let's do that. Public void reset state. And we will initially call this from start. So when the ghost first starts, we're going to reset the state. Um, and so instead of just simply setting our game object oh well that's i was outlining the wrong thing but here in our reset state we're gonna call reset state which makes sense um and same thing for pac-man let's go ahead and just add that function real quick for pac-man as well so reset states you know, initially of course we want to set these to be active but there will be more so for example we're going to want to reset our movement as well if you remember we added a reset state for movement. So we want to do various things in here. Um, so game manager, reset state. So yeah, in our game manager, in our reset state function, we loop through our ghost and reset state, and we reset state on Pac-Man. In each of those respective reset functions, you know, Pac-Man will reset its movement state and it'll turn the object back on. Um, let me think, is there anything else we need to do as well? I don't think so. I think for Pac-Man, it's pretty simple. The ghost will have a little bit more. Um, so for the ghosts, we should do some of those same things. Let's set the object to be active. Let's reset our movement. Those are the same between Pac-Man and the ghosts. Let me order these the same. So that's the same, but the ghosts have all these other behaviors that need to get reset too. Um, and so, for all of our ghosts, they will never start in frightened mode. So we can always just disable that. They will never start in chase mode either. So we can disable that. And they all technically start in scatter mode. Um, I guess one thing I didn't mention is you can have multiple behaviors running at the same time. Um, 
So frightened, never initially, chase, never initially, scatter. Yes, they're all considered scatter. Um, and then they're going to synchronize. They're going to kind of flip back and forth between scatter and chase. Um, and so initially it's scatter and then it'll flip to chase and then so on. And then here we also could maybe want to disable home, but it depends because for some of them home will be enabled initially and others it won't. So what we can do here is say, if this dot home does not equal our initial behavior, well then we want to disable it. Otherwise, um, if you actually have set an initial behavior, let's just be safe here and null check that. Make sure in case you don't assign this value, we want to not cause an error. But if assuming you have, we then will enable whatever that initial behavior is. So that is how we can reset the state of all of our behaviors and stuff. Um, and then finally, all that's really missing now from our um, ghost is checking for collision between the ghost and Pac-Man and then calling to our game manager that a ghost was, er, yeah, that a ghost was eaten. Well, it depends. You'll either be, either Pac-Man will be eaten or the ghost will be eaten when those two collide. It just, it just depends. All right, so we can add that collision by saying on collision enter 2d so this is not on trigger enter because these aren't triggers they're actual you know they're not marked as triggers they're just normal colliders here we have a collision 2d rather than a collider 2d reference so collision and we can check first let's make sure that the thing we're colliding with is indeed pac-man so collision game object layer equals layer mask name to layer pac-man and then here it depends we will either eat the ghost or eat pac-man so if the ghost is frightened so if frightened is enabled well that means the ghost is is going to be eaten so we can call to our game manager and say the ghost was eaten and we're, pa we're passing the ghost that was eaten which is this if the ghost isn't frightened well then that means that our that pac-man was eaten so we have those two respective um, functions there and that's actually it so there was a little bit of logic here um, for our ghost but most of the logic and behaviors will be defined in these different classes which we'll go over one by one we have got our base class here which just has some functions for enabling and disabling with set durations um, and then we have our resets, reset state functions that we've added um, let me check the game manager to make sure we have everything we need. I believe we do. Ghost eaten, Pac-Man eaten. Yeah, we've already done all of that, so we should be good. Um, we can probably test some of this out if we want. And let me make sure that we're not missing any um, anything in our base prefab. Yeah, so I guess we can set our, our durations here. Um, so the 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 home duration will vary based on each ghost each one um takes you know some of them take longer to exit than others scatter is usually seven seconds and chase is usually 20 seconds if you want to follow the um the original pac-man game frightened duration we don't technically have to set this value because it's going to get set by the power pellet but We'll do it anyways, and that would be eight seconds. For the home, once again, the home will vary. So if we go out of our, we should exit that prefab. And now for each respective ghost, we can set the duration. So um, for example, Blinky, since he already starts out, there is no duration on him. This is just zero. Um, for Inky, the blue one or the cyan one, he well let's start in order so pinky is the first one to leave so he'll leave after just like two seconds like oh oops that was the wrong man so pinky leaves first so two seconds basically right away then is inky the cyan one he will take maybe eight seconds before he leaves and clyde stays in there pretty long and he'll say let's say he'll say um or he'll what 16 seconds now, technically, this is not how the original Pac-Man was created. Um, there's more complex logic around like how many pellets you've eaten 
and the ghosts won't leave until you've eaten a certain amount of pellets. We're not going to be mimicking the original Pac-Man exactly just because it would add a lot of complexity and a lot more time to this tutorial and I know this game creating Pac-Man in this video is already going to be pretty long we're, we're probably already reaching on like two hours at this point so we're going to save some time by simplifying some things but the overall game is still going to feel very similar to the original um cool let's i mean we can maybe test some stuff here but since we don't have all their full movement we might not be able to i guess the only thing i really can test is that if i run into um if i run into the ghost here it should trigger our game over um oh maybe it's not um why did it not trigger anything Oh, so we're missing a few things. So one, our game manager is missing all the references to our ghosts. So now that we've created them all, we can we can establish those. So that's that's important. The other thing that's important that I just missed is in our base prefab or not our base prefab. We can actually do it there. But on all four of our ghosts here, we want to make sure we set our target to be um, Pac-Man. So we can drag in Pac-Man directly from our scene we need to set their initial behaviors as well so for blinky we'll click our blinky prefab and his initial behavior is to scatter and then the other three's initial behavior is home so we'll set those um so those are good so i those i feel like we're unrelated to the problem we just looked at but let's go ahead and test anyways I run into um, I run into the ghost, which should trigger our collision. It's not, so let's go ahead and test that out. Let's open up our script and let's debug this a little bit. Um, in theory, this should be working. So we have if collision game object dot layer equals layer mask um, name to layer. Oh, oops, I accidentally put a space in there. So that was just a typo. Let's test it again and hopefully it works this time let's play this again after it recompiles let's go ahead and just purposely run into there we go so pac-man disappeared um and yeah the thing everything reset so we died um everything reset we can actually check that our lives has been dec decremented so if we change this to debug yeah we can see our lives is two now instead of three Let's see if we get a game over state. So now our lives will be one. We respawn or reset. Let's run into it once more. Yeah, so notice how everything disappeared this time because that's what we programmed it to do on game over. Now we don't have any UI yet, so it doesn't feel right. But now in theory, if I press any key down, it should reset. Yep, and there it goes. So it resets now. And now we're back to our starting point. So awesome. So that's all working. The in terms of like the game state and everything, everything's working working well there. Um, cool. That's good for now. All right. Let's focus on the ghost scatter behavior first. So we can actually start to implement these various behaviors. I'm gonna do the scatter one first. Um, and now for scatter. Um, before we can actually do scatter, we need to get, we need to do a little bit more with our nodes. If you remember these, these nodes that we set up, these nodes will be used. So every time a ghost collides with one, it then determines which direction to go next. And so for our scatter mode, basically we're just going to make it so the the ghost will go in a random direction every time it hits a node. Now, once again, this is not technically accurate to the original game of Pac-Man. In the original game of Pac-Man, there are scatter modes. Each respective ghost goes to a different corner of the maze and kind of loops around in a predefined um, pattern. But once again, as I said earlier, we're going to do things slightly differently just to reduce complexity, simplify the game, um, or simplify the amount of effort it's going to take, because otherwise this video is going to end up being many, many, many hours long. And so once again, I think the actual gameplay will still feel relatively similar. You know, it's gonna actually feel pretty much the same, to be honest. Um, so we need to do a little bit more with these nodes before we can actually do the scatter. So we actually should create a new script called node. 
and let's go ahead and add that to our node prefab so select our node prefab here let's drag in that script there and essentially this script is just going to determine which directions are available so each node only has certain directions that they can go and so we want to know what those are that way um, it's easier the rest of our logic will be easier and so in our node here we're going to keep a list um, well, I need to import using system collections.generic so I can actually create a list here. We're going to create a list of vector2. And this is going to be called available directions. And I'm going to make this public getter private setter. And when our script first starts, we will go ahead and initialize this and then we need to populate this list with the available directions which we need to sort of calculate in a way um, to calculate those we kind of we we need to essentially do the same kind of box cast we did here and check if there's a wall there if there's a wall in that direction well then that direction is not available from that particular node and right, so let's have a function called uh, maybe check check available direction and let's pass in the direction we want to check okay so here we're going to do a box cast it's going to be pretty much the same thing so honestly let's just copy this initially um our starting position is the position of the node the size uh the size i'm going to make a little bit smaller 0.5 this time angle doesn't matter direction is the direction we're testing the distance will also be reduced to just one. We don't need that offset we were doing before. And then we, yeah, we need this obstacle layer. So we, that'll be the same. We, we do need that obstacle layer. So um, we'll add that just like we did for our movement script, obstacle layer. Cool. So we do our box cast and then we can check if it hit something if based on the collider. If the collider's null, that means we didn't hit something, which means that direction is available to go in. And so we can then add that to our list. This dot available directions that add that direction. And so now when we start, we basically just want to go through and check each of the cardinal directions. Let's check up, down, left, and right, down, left, and right. And so it's going to check all four. If it's available, it'll add it to the list. And then our different ghost behaviors can can determine, it, it can choose one of the directions available. Because we don't want to go in a direction that we actually can't. And the ghosts are going to look really stupid. So that's why this is pretty important. Um, cool. Let's go ahead and go back to our ghost scatter now. We can start implementing this. And for our ghost scatter, Remember, these are inheriting from ghost behavior. And so ghost behavior is going to handle like enabling and disabling them. We just really need to add the logic for what happens. All right. So um, all we need to do is check when the ghost enters one of those nodes. Um, so to do that on trigger enter 2D, um, collider 2D other. We need to get a reference to the node script here. That way we can check the available directions. Um, so we can just say node goes other get component. And if this is not null, if that's not null, then indeed we triggered a node. If it is null, then we triggered something else and we don't care, All right? So only if we actually have a proper reference to a node, do we want to do further logic? We also want to only do logic if this script is enabled, if this behavior is enabled, right? Um, because technically this function will always be called even when, um, even when the behavior is not enabled. So don't want to do any scatter movement if scatter is not enabled. And then also, um, when our ghost is frightened, that movement is going to kind of override everything. So just to be safe we want to um check that our ghost frightened is not enabled because um, once again you can have multiple behaviors at once 
So even when the ghost is frightened, you're still either going to be scattering or in chase mode. Because those, those two just kind of flip back and forth. If you're frightened, that movement is going to override everything. Um, so that's why we're checking here. We, we don't actually, although this script or this behavior might still be enabled, we don't actually want to do anything while you're frightened. Okay, so those are our sort of preconditions. Um, and from here, we're just going to pick a random um, direction that's available from this node. So we can just grab an index here, random.range from zero to however many available directions there are. So node.availableDirections.count. And then the one thing we want to do that makes this a little bit smarter, we don't want it so the ghost kind of goes back and forth. Like, let's say it hits a node. Let's say it's moving to the left and it hits a node. And then that node says, okay, now go to the right again. And then it like, you know, it just doesn't feel very good if, if the ghost like backtracks. So that's like one thing we want to check is that um, the, the ghost, um, if, if this random available direction happens to be the direction, um, the opposite direction of ours, we, we want to pick a different one. So we can say if node available directions at that index equals the opposite so the the negate here of whatever our current movement direction is and once again because we're inheriting from ghost behavior we have access to the ghost that this behavior is a part of and then that ghost has all the other references to everything else such as the movement so if this dot ghost dot movement dot direction, um, yeah. So if the random one we picked is the opposite of our current direction, we want to kind of change this so it goes in a different direction. We don't want to backtrack um, just because it feels better. Um, now we can only pick a different available direction if there is more than one available direction. If if that is the only possible direction, then then we can't do anything. Like we just have to go in that direction. Um, technically that's never the case because there's always at least two directions, but if your game's slightly different, then, you know, you never know. Um, so I need to add one more condition here, which is to say if our available directions count is greater than one. So if there are actually different directions to choose from, then we can go ahead and pick a different one instead. So here, all I'm going to do, I'm just going to increment this. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to change it to the next one. Um, rather than picking a random one again, because what if I get a random one again and it ha happens to be the same one, like I'll just increment it. I know, um, I know it's going to be different if that's the case. And then the only problem is if, if it picked the very last one randomly and then I increment it, well now I've overflowed. So we need to make sure that if that happens, we wrap it back around to zero. So if our index is greater than or equal to however many there are we wrap it back to zero and then finally we can set our ghost new movement direction so this like ghost movement set direction to um to that available direction so node oops node dot node dot available directions and then whatever our final index ends up being and that's that's actually it for our scattered mode so just a kind of basically a random movement. Um, once again, technically it's not the true scatter mode of the original Pac-Man, um, but we're gonna do this differently. Really, we could have called this something else. Maybe we just call this like ghost random or something. That would have been fine, but. Um, and one thought I just had is, um, I'm going to go back to our node script here and I'm going to, oh, you know what? Nope, never mind. Yeah, never mind. We're good. We're all good. Nothing needs to happen. Um, let's go ahead and test this out. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and test this. Let's recompile. And Blinky should already be starting in the scatter mode, right? So his his initial behavior is scatter. So he should already be in that mode. So we should finally see him start moving around. Nope. So he still got stuck. So nothing happened. There's definitely a problem still. Let's make sure. Yeah. So here's our problem is we forgot to set our obstacle layer on our node script. Let's go to our node prefab, find our script and set our obstacle layer. 
Let's try that one more time. Nope, still nothing. Okay, so what else could be the problem? Let's first make sure that our um, script is actually running on trigger enter 2D. So we can debug log just anything to say, yes, this is happening. And then the other, oh, this is the other problem. So I'm saying other, no, no, that should be fine. Let's throw a different debug statement in here. Let me just make it a different word. Doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and this, oh, I did this wrong. Oops, my logic's backwards. We want to execute this if the behavior is enabled. I did if it's not enabled, so that didn't make any sense. So if we have a node and our behavior is enabled and we're not frightened, then we want to go ahead. So that was just a simple mistake. All right, so let's test again for real this time, hopefully. Yep, there you go. So he, boom, he's just moving. He's just kind of moving around randomly. Oh, he even took the passage. The passage works for the ghosts, just like it does for Pac-Man. Uh, he did just get stuck there, so that's a problem. That is definitely an issue we will need to fix. Um, let's see. So if we select him while the game's still running, let me debug this a little bit. And let me see here. Oh, you know what? It's actually not an issue. It feels like an issue, but it's because he stopped entering scatter mode. Because the scatter mode only lasts seven seconds. And that's because at this point, he's now supposed to transition to chase mode, but we haven't implemented that yet. And so scatter got disabled. He would then be chasing. And yeah, but so there's actually not a problem there. Um, one thing we do need to do is make it so he transitions to chase mode. So all we have to do is say on disable. So when when this script is disabled, th this um, is a function Unity calls automatically. We will go to our ghost, go to our chase behavior and enable that. All right, so anytime you stop scattering it then transitions to chasing. And that's it. So scatter mode is good. We're all good there. Okay, now we can do the opposite of scatter, which is our chase mode. So our chase mode, it's just going to follow Pac-Man around directly. Um, and this is where, once again, the original Pac-Man game, each ghost actually has a different chase behavior. Blinky directly chases Pac-Man, but some of the others, for example, try to put themselves in front of Pac-Man. I think even one of them will chase Pac-Man, but as soon as it gets close, it then flees away. So if we wanted to do this one-to-one -to, -one to the original game, it would require a lot more time and effort. And um, that would be a good thing I would challenge all of you to do is to see how you can maybe implement different behaviors that are unique to each of the ghosts. We're going to kind of get the basics in place. And it's once again, it's going to feel very much like the original game, just not exactly. Let's go ahead and go to our ghost chase now. And kind of we need the same setup here, which is like on trigger enter, we get a node and so on. It's just the logic inside is going to be different. So I can honestly just copy everything here and paste that in to our chase. And now when chase is disabled, we want to switch to scatter. So these two just kind of flip flop, flip a flop back and forth. Um, our logic inside here is going to be completely different though. So instead of doing picking a random direction and so on, we need to um, have the ghost traverse towards whatever the target is. If you remember on our base ghost class here, we have this target. So this is the object you are going to chase, for example, which will be Pac-Man. Um, so if we have a node, and the chase is enabled and our ghost is not frightened, then we should actually move our Pac-Man or move our ghost, I mean. So the logic here is gonna be very different. We need to find the shortest path. Essentially, we need to loop through all of the available directions at this node. And then we need to calculate, okay, if, if we were to move in that direction, does that put you farther away from our target or closer? And whichever direction brings you the closest to the target is the direction we want to move in. 
and then algorithmically it's just going to work for the entire thing it'll just automatically do the pathfinding based on that simple logic so let's go ahead and implement this um so we need to know we want to store the direction that's currently like our shortest direction right initially this will just be set to zero because we don't know yet and we also want to know what our minimum distance is we want to keep track of the minimum distance and then we can check okay is this next is the next direction even um less than what we currently think is the is the min distance and if it is then that means we're bringing ourselves even closer to the target and so initially this is just going to be the largest value possible that way basically the very first direction is always going to be less than float.max value um but then from that point on as you check other directions you know we're going to compare to this and see okay is this is this direction put us closer um so we're going to loop through each of our available directions for each vector two available direction in node.available directions we're going to calculate the new position of the ghost if it were to move to this um to the in this direction so new position equals this dot transform that position plus a new vector three um, where we take our nodes available um, or yeah we take that available direction dot x available direction dot y and we're not going to set the z um, we don't want our z um, because that's used for draw order as i've mentioned before so that's our new position if we were to move in that direction and now we can calculate the distance from this new position to our target so we can say um, distance equals this dot ghost dot target dot position minus our new position this gives us a vector that points our ghost to the target and then we can get the magnitude of that um, we can get the magnitude of that vector to determine distance and specifically, I'm going to use square magnitude because it's more performant. It's way more performant. You actually want to avoid using normal magnitude as much as possible because it uses a square root function. And square root functions are very, very slow, very, very costly. Um, so in our case, square magnitude, it works completely fine. It actually doesn't change the logic at all. Um, now that we have the distance of our ghost from that direction, we can say okay if this if the distance in this direction is less than whatever we currently think is the lowest then well this direction is better we want we want to go in this direction instead so we'll set this one to be our new available direction um, or to be the direction that we end up traversing in and then we'll update our min that way as it continues to loop over each one maybe the next one is even closer it brings the ghost even closer so it's just gonna loop through all and eventually you're gonna be left with whatever is the is the direction that puts you the closest to the target and so then we just simply need to assign our movement ghost.movement set direction to whatever ended up being the the shortest um cool i think that's it Let's go ahead and test this. Yeah, let's go ahead and test this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put Pac-Man in the corner. And initially we should see the Blinky here is just gonna scatter around randomly. He scatters for seven seconds initially. And then he randomly, or not randomly, then he will specifically chase me. So we'll see for sure. I think he's already in chase mode. Yeah, so he's coming at me. He's yeah, he's moving right at me. Like he's gonna follow me exactly, because now he's in chase mode. So look at that. Like it just works perfectly. Um, and he's gonna chase me for 20 seconds, and then he should go back to being. Um, he should go back to scattering at some point. So probably soon. Yeah, I think he's in scatter mode now. Yeah, he is. We can see if we click that. Oh, he just switched back to chase. And we can see it kind of goes back and forth between those two. So that's all working perfectly. Awesome. All right, now let's do our home behavior. So let's focus on these three ghosts inside. And just temporarily, I'm going to turn off Blinky. 
Although actually I think it gets um, reset anyway, so that actually won't do anything. Um, yeah, so let's focus on our three ghosts inside. So let's implement our ghost home behavior here. Now this one's going to be the most, I don't know, unique or different than the rest because the movement is just inherently different. It's not node based. They kind of just bounce around back and forth until they eventually leave. And then them leaving is like a custom kind of animation we need to do. So this one is pretty tricky, but I'll walk us through it. And all in all, it's actually not that much code, but it was uh, kind of difficult to figure out how to implement this initially. Um, so for our ghost home, we actually need a couple references to some transforms. We need a reference to some transform that's just gonna be right in the middle of the home. And then one that's like outside. That way we can kind of change that we can have the ghost go to the first position and then go to the second position as kind of our way of exiting. Um, so we're going to add a transform for the home itself. Transform, transform, yeah. And then let's add one for the exit as well. So one's kind of inside and one's outside. We could also maybe just name it that. Um, We'll do that actually. We'll say inside transform and outside transform. And we're just gonna say inside and outside. Um, cool. So when this behavior is disabled, in other words, like when the ghost is at home, you know, they should just be bouncing around. But when they are no longer at home, the script gets disabled, we need to perform this animation of them leaving. All right, so we can implement on disable, which once again gets called automatically by Unity when this behavior is disabled. Um, and we can, we're gonna use something that's a little bit more advanced in Unity, which is a coroutine. They're not that difficult, but um, they might be a little confusing if you've never used them before. I need to impo import system.collections first. And we're gonna create a coroutine. So to do that, we can say start coroutine and then we need to call a, a function um, we need to call a function here um, this function needs to return i enumerator this is how you define a coroutine and we're going to call this the exit transition okay so start coroutine coroutine exit um, exit transition and we're going to call that we're going to actually call this function and then the result of that is what we pass to our start coroutine. Now inside here, basically a coroutine allows us to yield, um, to kind of pause execution um, temporarily. It allows us to yield the execution of this function. And the reason we're doing that is because there's, it's sort of a sequence, the, the animation is kind of a sequence. First, we need to move to the this inside position, and then we can move from the inside to the outside. Um, that way the, the ghosts always kind of perfectly, you know, if the, like, for example, the ones on the left and right, they can't just like go up. Like they need to first go to the center point and then go out. So that's why we have those two transforms there, which we will, we, we still need to create those, but that, that's kind of the easy part. So in terms of the actual movement here, um, we need to start animating this. The other tricky part is that we need to turn off the normal movement of the ghost. You know, we, we have our movement script. We need to turn this off or disable this on our ghost while we're doing this transition. Um, and we need to turn off our rigid body because, um, we, or we need to mark our rigid body as kinematic. That way the ghost can actually move while um, technically colliding with these objects. So let's start by doing that. This.ghost.movement set direction to be up. The, the, the ghost will always be going up. And this is one of those cases where we want to force it. Because if you don't force it, they're gonna it's gonna think that you can't move up because there are technically colliders here so it's gonna think oh no you can't move up but we're gonna force it to go up then we're gonna turn off our rigid body well we don't, you can't really turn off a rigid body but we can mark it as oh did we not establish a reference to our rigid body we didn't we forgot a reference to our rigid body so let's go ahead and add that real quick rigid body 2d rigid body 
get private sets. This is new. Let's get our... Oh, you know what we can do? Just kidding. We have a reference to the rigid body in the movement class. So we can do that instead. We can say this.ghost.movement.rigidbody is kinematic to true. Um, this will essentially, in a way, like turn off physics on the object, turn off collisions and such, just while we're doing this transition. And we're also going to just turn off our movement script as well. So turn that off. And then eventually, once we're done, we're going to return all these back on. All right, so there can be some code in the middle here, but um, once this is done, this gets re-enabled. Our kinematic is no longer kinematic, and our direction will actually just be random. It'll either just randomly go left or right. So to do that, we can create a new vector too, um, and just pick a random value. If that random random dot value returns a value between zero and one, if it's less than half, we'll go let's say to the left. If it's greater than half, we'll go to the right. And then our um, y is zero. We don't want to go up. But yeah, just picking a random direction left or right there. Um, and we're going to force that one as well. I don't think we actually would need... I don't think we need to, but just in case, we're going to force it. Because we we, we got to make sure our Pac-Man starts moving left or right. Um, cool. And now let's do all the code in the middle here. So this is just going to be an animation, essentially. Uh, we're animating the position of the ghost. So let's get... Uh, let's keep track of what our current position is. So this up transform that position. And we need to establish some timing variables. So let's say it takes half a second to go. Um, it's going to take half a second to go between each node. So in full, it's going to take one second to fully transition. Um, we need to keep, keep track of how much time has elapsed. So initially that's zero. And then now we can start animating. So while elapsed is less than duration, we're going to continue to update the position of our ghost. So we're going to say um, this.ghost.transform.position equals whatever position we assign here. Um, or we need, a, we need a new position here. So new position. Okay, so new position. Initially, it just will be whatever our ghosts position or whatever our basic position is but we're going to override the x and y and we're going to lerp um or actually here let me redo this so new position we're gonna we're gonna lerp we're gonna interpolate between our current position and our um the the transform we're moving towards so vector three dot lerp between so basically we're lerping between a and b and then t is like a percentage so that's what that's why we need these timing variables so from our initial position to our inside position in this uh, inside that position and then our duration or our t here is a percentage so elapsed divided by duration gives us the percentage of time so that's our new position we just need to make sure we're setting our z back to whatever it normally was because um, we don't want to actually change our z and then we can set that um, we can set that on our set that as the new position of our ghost afterwards we need to increase time so elapsed plus equals time that delta time that way it continues to go more and more or move more and more but this is where every frame you know we don't want to execute this entire while loop all at once and this is where the coroutine comes into play where is we want to yield now so yield return null and it's going to wait a frame and then it's going to continue right where it left off so it moves once it waits one frame and then it continues and then it waits one frame and then it continues and it just keeps doing it until eventually our lapsed is greater than our duration in which case our percentage would be one and if our percentage is one then the position of our ghost is going to be whatever we set here which means we are we fully animated to that spot um, now we just need to do the exact same thing but instead we need to go from our inside position to our outside position make sure the z is set back up set our new position increase time and so on 
the only thing we need to do is make sure we reset the elapsed time in between that way it, it it's as if it's a brand new animation so that is this is maybe the most complicated code in, of all of our projects um unfortunately but it's not too bad um we're using core routines which is pretty neat one thing that's missing here just for you know safety is whenever this is enabled we should stop all core routines just in case in case for whatever reason there's one running um we should stop so just you can kind of see these are inverses of one another on enable or on disable we start it we start the exit on enable we stop great so that's that we need to set these references now let's go ahead and create those transforms in our scene so let's go to our grid let's go to our walls here or no let's go to our nodes it doesn't i don't think it really matters to be honest but let's go to our nodes let's create an empty object here and we're going to call this inside we're going to create another one called outside and so inside should be right in the center so this should be negative 0.5 and outside should be there with 2.5 so inside and outside and then we need to just make sure we select all four of our ghosts and assign these references so inside outside and let's go ahead and test out that transition so they're going to be standing still at first um, and then one of them should leave right away um, it doesn't look like it's working oh nope there it goes yeah that worked he left that wasn't pinky should have went right away though pinky's supposed to be the first one to leave um so i don't know why inky inky left inky's duration is eight Pinky's duration is two. Um, oh, I made a mistake here in that I set the wrong on Pinky. I told it to start Inky's behavior, so that's that was just incorrect. Let me just go back through. So initial behavior is of Inky is Inky's home. Initial behavior of Pinky is Pinky's home or Pinky's home script, and then the initial behavior of Clyde should be Clyde's home. So that was just a mistake from earlier. I should have, I'll probably apply those two. Apply that, and apply, you know, let's go. Okay, let's test that one again. So we should see Pinky leave first, pretty much right away. And then, and then Inky, and then Clyde eventually. Yeah, so Pinky left, Clyde will leave in a few seconds. He takes a total of eight seconds, so there, there we go, he leaves. Now Clyde should leave next. He takes 16 seconds. You can see all the ghosts are chasing me right now. And there, there's um, there's Clyde. And he immediately starts chasing me as well because all of their chase and scatter sequences are all kind of synced up with one another. So that's good. There's still one more thing we want to do though, which is while they're just sitting waiting, they should just be kind of moving up and down. And so this is fairly easy to do. But once again, we can't do it with node with our node movement like we've done for our scatter and chase. Um, and we also, we can't do on trigger enter because um, they're actually colliding with the walls. They're, they're colliding with actual walls there. So we want to do on collision, on collision enter 2D, collision, or yeah, collision 2D, um, close collision. So if, if this behavior is enabled, that's the first thing we want to check for. And the object we are colliding with is indeed a um, obstacle. I don't imagine it would be anything else, but it's never, it doesn't hurt to, to just be safe here. Let's make sure the object we're colliding with is an obstacle or a wall. Then we should just make our ghost basically, every time it hits a wall, it's just gonna then go the opposite direction. So they're just gonna kind of bounce up and down essentially. So we can say this.ghost.movement set direction to be whatever the opposite is of its current direction. So we just negate it to, to get the opposite. And that's, that's actually it for that. Let's go ahead and test that. So we should just see them kind of bounce up and down, hopefully. No, not quite. So that did not work. So 
So I'm assuming then that they might not actually be. Um, oh, we have. Oh, th so this is this is unrelated, but this is an error where um, on disable will also get called when our objects are destroyed. And so if you try to start a code routine when the object is getting destroyed, you get that error. We can f prevent that error just by making sure that this object is actually active. And that'll make sure that that error doesn't happen. But that was completely unrelated to our current problem, which is that our collision is not getting called here. So let me just throw a debug in here and make sure that indeed this is getting called. Um, collision game object dot layer is our obstacle. Every time you collide, we op we set our direction to be the opposite. I think that should be working, but we'll see. Let's test it again. All right, let's run this. Nope, nothing's happening. Your scripts are enabled. I mean, it is, it did initially, I mean, it is getting called. It's just, they're not moving. They're just not actually moving. So why would that be? Um, let me debug this further. Let's go ahead and look at Inky, for example. Switch this to debug. Currently, his movement is set to be negative one. Or no, his current movement is up. So yeah, so he's going up. Now, he's not actually moving up. So that, that's because he's probably colliding with the walls, which is preventing him from moving up. Oh, yeah, you know what? So this is our issue we actually need to not have colliders in the inside here so we need to go to our grid we need to then go to our walls and open the tile palette and we need to erase this inside we don't actually want that inside there so because they literally are colliding it's completely preventing them from moving so we erase that empty space there that way they have some free space to move around um, and now we should be good. Let's test this one more time. Yeah, there we go. And then they just kind of move up and down. And then they still exit and everything. All that still works the same. Awesome. Cool. Let me go ahead and delete this debug statement. And there we go. So we just have one behavior left. And then we're pretty much done. All right, let's do our very final ghost behavior and then we're basically done. We have a complete working game of Pac-Man. So we need ghost frightened. This is maybe, this one has the most code to it in terms of the ghost behaviors. The home one is maybe the most complex, but there is more code needed for this one. Although the code itself is fairly straightforward. Um, but the frightened mode is kind of a very drastic change to the ghost behavior. Um, and so one thing we need to do is we need to also change the way the ghost looks. We need to turn on some rent sprite renders and turn off others. So our go our frightened behavior here is going to have a reference to all of the sprite renders. Um, so for the body, for the eyes, for the... Um, for the blue, you know, when it's blue and also when it's white, we'll have a reference to all of those. And we'll have to establish those in the editor. We also want to know or have a variable to detect if the go or not detect, but to, to, to know whether the ghost has been eaten. Um, so this will be a public getter, private setter. And we can go ahead and start implementing this. Um, so here we actually need to override our enable function. That's part of our base go, um, ghost behavior class. Specifically, we need to override enable rather than just simply implementing on enable because, well, I'll explain why in a minute. We're gonna end up using both, but let's just start by overriding our normal enable. So here we still want to call the base class. We still call the base function, but then we need to do some additional work here, which is to turn on and off the, the appropriate renderers. So when you become frightened, the normal body goes away. The eyes go away. We 
turn those off. Can't type. And our blue becomes on. Um, and then the white um, is off initially, but it will turn on after a few seconds. Um, and so, yeah, after a few seconds, we need to start flashing, which is really what this fourth sprite renderer does. So we need to turn that one on after a few seconds to indicate that the ghost is going to be exiting this state soon. So we can invoke a new function here. Um, let me just get rid of this function for now. I'm going to replace this. I'm going to have a function called flash. Um, so invoke flash after, let's just say half the duration or duration. Yeah. So once the ghost has only half of this state or behavior left, it's going to start flashing. And so when it starts flashing, we're basically going to do, um, we're going to turn off the blue one and turn on the white one. Um, and then let's see what else uh, we, the important thing here is the reason why we have this is because we only want to do this with, we haven't been eaten. And that's because if you are, if you have been eaten, oops, I didn't mean to do that go back um if you have been eaten well then we we're going to end up disabling everything but the eyes only the eyes will show and so we don't want to turn this back on um so we gotta just add that little condition there to make sure that you know that that's not causing an issue uh, the other thing too is every time the ghost starts flashing again um, we need to make sure that that um, animation is being reset to the beginning because we don't we can't guarantee the timing is always going to line up so we can just get a component or get a reference to um, our animated sprite script that we wrote and just call that restart function that we we implemented okay from here let's see um, flash so yeah when it gets enabled, we're going to turn on the sprites we want, and then we're going to invoke flash after half of its duration. Um, the reason why we want to do this by overriding enable rather than just doing on enable is because if the ghost is already enabled, and then this gets enabled a second time. So for example, if you eat a power pellet, and then you already eat another power pellet, while within the duration of the first one we need to make sure that these renders are getting reset back to their thing and that our invoke here is getting re reset and everything um, otherwise it's possible that uh, the the ghost won't actually be in the proper state because on enable the on enable function will only get called the very it only get called when it actually is enabled from a disabled state if it's already enabled and you try to enable it again then it won't that function won't actually get called but since this is our own custom function you know we can still call this you know when it however we want so so we specifically want to override that which is important and then the other thing is when our um ghost when, or when our ghost is no longer frightened so when this is disabled we want to make sure we reset all of our sprites back to their normals so body should be true eyes should be true blue and white then should be false so just kind of the inverse there sort of um and then let's see we need to have a function of when we get eaten um, we need to change our speed multiplier. So that's what we can do on enable and on disable. So let's go ahead and do those on enable. So this only needs to happen once. It doesn't matter. Um, it's not going to have any effect. I mean, we could just do it in here for simplicity, but this technically is a little bit more proper, but we want to set our speed multiplier. So when you're frightened, you're going to be moving slower. So we can just boom, cut our speed in half with the multiplier. And then once again, on disable, we'll make sure we reset that back to its normal. Speed multiplier is one. Um, anytime this is enabled or disabled, we want to make sure we reset this eaten state. That way, if you, if it comes frightened again, it can get re-eaten again. So we'll just set that to false in both. And technically, it doesn't need to be in both, but that's fine. And also, when our... Um, let's see... 
when our I'm trying to think here no that should all be fine I think we're good there um we still need to do movement so when you're in a frightened state the the ghost is going to be running away from the target it's kind of going to be the exact opposite of this which is instead of going closest it's going to go the farthest um and then we also need to check for oh no we already are checking if if the ghost is colliding so here we had this logic on collision of pac-man if it's frightened then we say the ghost has been eaten otherwise pac-man has been eaten i think the important thing here is we need a function called or you know what we'll do this we'll do it this way um we'll just also add this to our frightened so on collision enter if you collide with pac-man and this is indeed enabled um if the ghost is frightened then we we can call a new function which is that you've been eaten which is going to once again set our sprite renders a specific way and so our other script will handle um communicating back to the game manager this one just needs to worry about changing the sprite the sprites and stuff so in our eaten state here we want to make sure we set that variable to true we want to um set the position of our ghost um yeah we need to update the position of our ghost to home like it's just gonna the ghost will just move to the home now um position here so get our current position and then we're going to update this to be this ghost we can go to the home reference our home behavior which has that reference to the inside transform and we can set it to that position um oh yeah you know what we'll do it this way so we'll do that and then we just need to make sure we set our z back to how it was so position.z is this that goes transform position .z. make sure we're not changing our z um and so yeah our ghost now moves to home now in the original pac-man the ghost actually like traverses to the home um rather in this case it's just going to instantly jump home but small detail in my opinion that once again we're just doing this to save time because this video is already going to be super long but feel free, you know, see how you can change this code to not just instantly teleport home, but instead actually traverse there. Um, the other thing we want to do now is indicate that we are home. So we want to go to our home behavior and, and, and enable that, turn that on. And it should be turned on. So our home behavior, there's a duration on that, which determines how long the ghosts stay within the home. Now, if they've been eaten, they need to wait there until the until that state is up. And so if we rely just on the default duration that's specified by our ghost, then they're going to leave prematurely. They're going to leave when they're still in an eaten state. And so at the very least, we want to say that they should remain. They should remain in the home for however long our frightened duration is um, this will guarantee they never leave before leaving um, or before our frightened state is up um cool i'm gonna rearrange this a little bit oh you know what we'll keep it that's all fine what else do we need to do now we just need to essentially change our sprites again so i can just copy all four of these and make sure these get set appropriately body should be false eyes should be true blue so everything's false except for the eyes and that's what happens when you are eaten um let's test this out for now we still need to handle the specific movement but that will actually be pretty easy because we're going to mostly just copy and paste from our chase script um, let's see now now oh one thing we're not doing oh, also got an error so that's a problem um oh yeah so we added those sprite renders here now we need to go ahead and assign all those references let's go to our base ghost prefab let's open that up and let's go to let's just set all these body eyes blue and white that's good um 
we need to we need to actually tell our ghosts our ghosts to become frightened when we eat a power pellet all right so in our game manager um where's our game manager when a ghost is eaten or not when a ghost is eaten when you eat a power pellet yeah we even have this to do here so we can loop through all of our ghosts i is less than this that ghost that, uh this that ghost yeah there we go that length i plus plus and we can say this that goes i dot frighten dot enable for however long our pellets duration is so our power pellet duration we will enable it for that long um yeah i think we're good there let's test this out for real this time um and yeah so let's pick up a pellet. Yep, they turned. Let's eat one. Boom, he, he was eaten. He transported back. And now he is, um, you know, stuck in the home. There still seems like there's a bug with the ghost not traversing. Let me test that real quick. So here, um, Inky, for example, is stuck in the corner. Debug. He is set to chase, but he's not chasing for whatever reason. Um, we do have a reference to Pac-Man, so he should be chasing. Oh, I think I know the problem. But ghost frightened. Um, ghost frightened. Yeah, so... Oh, let me see. The movement is set to be left. Wait, inky left is one. Oh, he should be moving to the left, but he's not. Or no, he's moving to the right. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's moving to the right, which is pushing him against the wall. I think the problem there is that um, when our ghost is... When our ghost is set to... This is kind of confusing to explain, but basically because there's no code running to set the movement state so if you remember for like scatter and chase for example we say if the ghost is not frightened then don't or if the ghost is frightened don't do any of this code same thing for chase and so there's no other code that's setting the movement um direction of the ghosts um and so then while they're frightened and there's like a specific point in time where they transition where they just don't end up doing anything and then they get stuck however just like we experienced the first time this is going to get solved as soon as we finish the rest of the script and so we actually yeah our test there was good we were able to eat a power pellet they changed we ate one it went back all that was good we just need to make sure that um we're handling specific movements um the specific movement of the ghosts when they are frightened so we're honestly you're just going to copy and paste everything from our chase script because it's really the exact same thing just sort of instead of min direction it'll be the max let's go ahead and paste this in on trigger enter 2d and all we need to do is essentially flip some of these these variables so um if the note we have a node and we're frightened we don't need this anymore um our direction here will yep we'll start out at zero instead of min distance this will be max distance and instead of starting at the max it's going to start at the min value we loop through we get the new position that's all the same we calculate the distance that's all the same but now instead of seeing if we're less than the min we're going to see if we're greater than the max and if we are, that becomes our new available direction or the new direction we're going to move in, update that, and then, and then we move. So pretty much the same logic, just go the farthest away from our target object, which is Pac-Man. Um, cool, let's test this out again. And now, like, and really, we have a fully playable game of Pac-Man now, too, which is pretty awesome. I can eat all the pellets. I can grab that. Let's eat this ghost. It gets reset. Um, there's two ghosts sort of inside of each other right now, which is fine. Watch. So here, I'm going to wait till they start flashing. I'm going to eat another pellet. And boom, they should reset entirely. And so they're still blue and they're not flashing anymore. It resets all the duration and everything. 
go ahead and eat this group of ghosts. All of them were eaten. Awesome. Let's try to actually eat all of the pellets to also test that we start new rounds. I don't think we ever actually tested that. Um, all the ghosts are currently chasing me. We can grab these over here. Yeah. Probably. Uh, they might be. Yeah, I think they're in scatter mode now. We ate all the pellets. Everything resets. Beautiful. So, I mean, we're done. We have a fully working game of um, Pac-Man now is pretty awesome one pretty minor thing that we haven't done just to kind of finish off our game here is to set the direction of our ghosts eyes based on the direction they're moving so this is just a pretty simple script a uh, pretty simple script just to change the sprite the eye sprites so let's go ahead and create a script called ghost eyes and this is going to need um a few references to all the variation, all the eye variations. So we need four sprite references. Go ahead and add those sprites. Oops, I can't type sprites. And we'll just say up, down, left, and right. And essentially now in our update function, we're just going to set the sprite on the sprite render based on our current direction. Um, although we need a reference to our sprite renderer so we can actually do that. So we'll get it in a wake. We need to create a variable for it. Sprite renderer, sprite renderer. Make this another get public getter, private setter. We'll assign this here. Sprite renderer equals get component. Um, sprite renderer we also actually need a reference to the movement script um, because the movement script contains the direction and so we need that as well movement movement we'll establish this as well and this one if you remember our eyes are actually a child of the ghost and so we need to reference that in the parent so we can say get component in parent movement and now in update we can just do some a couple simple if statements to then set the right sprite so if this that movement that direction equals up well then we want to set the sprite on our render to be this dot up and then essentially same thing else if else if else if so if it's up down left and right and that's really all we need for the eyes of our ghosts let's go ahead and test this out we need to add that script to our base ghost prefab here so let's go to our ghost and we're going to add this specifically on the eyes object there so we'll throw that on ghost eyes make sure we assign our four sprites so eyes up eyes down eyes left and eyes right okay so because we added that to our base prefab it will already automatically be on all four of our individual ghosts and let's just test so we can test blinky yep down left down let's make sure he goes in all directions right we need to see him go up hey, that guy's going up yeah so it's all working everything's good there we can still of course eat our ghosts there we go that was just a quick little simple thing and there we go so at this point, we're, we can consider this a done project. We have fully implemented Pac-Man. It is not, of course, exact one-to-one -to, -one to the original game of Pac-Man, but it's pretty close, to be honest. It looks the exact same. Um, it plays relatively the same. Obviously, the AI behaviors of our ghosts aren't exact. They're, they're a little bit dumbed down just because the complexity would require a lot more time on this and this is already a pretty long tutorial um, there are a number of other things we didn't implement so for example we didn't do any ui i had originally planned to do the ui as part of the tutorial here but honestly the ui is pretty simple there's not a whole lot to it um, and overall a fairly minor thing 
But if you are interested in seeing what the UI design could look like, um, you know, displaying your score and lives and all that, then the full project of this game on GitHub has all of that. It has score, lives UI, it has a, some game over UI. It's all pretty basic once again, but you know, feel free to download that project and take a look and see all the code for it as well. All that code is going to be handled through the game manager. There's honestly, once again, not that much to it. Some of the other things we didn't do is fruits. So there are like fruit objects in Pac-Man that give you bonus points and stuff. Um, we didn't we didn't end up implementing that. That's a challenge that I would uh, give to you guys to see how you can um, maybe implement fruit on your own. Um, and then there's also a couple of just small things like um, when Pac-Man dies, there's actually supposed to be like a little death animation and we didn't do that. But you, that's actually fairly easy to do considering we have that animated sprite. It's just a matter of turning on that object at the right or turning on that animation at the right time. Um, so all in all, there's a few things missing. The AI behavior is not exactly the same, but I mean, as you can see here, this is a very playable game. It's still challenging like the original game of Pac-Man. Um, it's still fun. Um, yeah. And so I encourage everyone, take a look at the full project in GitHub. There's a link in the description of the video if you want to see some of those extra features and whatnot. Um, but I'm going to say that concludes this tutorial. I really appreciate you taking the time to learn how to make Pac-Man with me. A lot of effort went into making this tutorial, so please give the video a like if you feel like you learned something, and even share it with your friends. Uh, I do have a community Discord server for game developers to collaborate and learn from one another. If you run into any problems creating Pac-Man, then feel free to join the Discord where I can offer direct help. If you want to support my work even more, then you can become a Patreon supporter to receive exclusive benefits. Once again, thank you for watching. See you in the next one.